Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am calling the to order the January 2020 MFAC meeting. I have a short statement that I would like to go on record prior to going to agenda items. We have a busy agenda for today's business meeting and a hard 1230 stop time. In order to get through our various agenda items, I am going to ask that Jared Silver provide periodic time management updates to try to keep us on schedule. In order to discuss and vote on all action items and review the most time sensitive discussion items, we may have to delay certain discussion items to the February business meeting and cancel other business for this month. I will evaluate the need to do this as the meeting progresses. I'd also like to remind the public that this is not a public hearing and public comment will only be accepted at the end of the meeting under other business if time permits. Lastly, I've been informed that votes must occur by roll call rather than unanimous consent and Jared Silver will be facilitating roll call votes on all actionable items. I'd like to move into item one, introductions and announcements, uh, the review and approval of the January 28th, 2021 business meeting agenda. You have your hand up. Uh, yes, Ray, uh, this is Dan McKernan, and I would request that 2C and 2D be reversed so that uh, under comments, it would be chairman, commissioner, law enforcement. And if you would indulge me, I'd like to go last in that list. Uh, that's fine with me, Dan. And if in the interest of times, you just want to forego the law enforcement discussion, um, we're amenable to that due to time. So I'm saying that we will modify agenda item two to strike 2D law enforcement comments, having the last item in section two be the director's comments. Thank you, Jared. Can we move to have a motion to approve that the January agenda as amended? So moved by Bill. Bill Doyle with a motion to move. Is there a second? Second by Tim Brady. Suki, you have your hand up. Okay, we're gonna go to roll call vote. Tim Brady. Yes. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Peardnock. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yeah. The agenda is approved, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have one correction in my, uh, when I call this meeting to order, I announced the January 2020 and it should be January 2021. Sorry about that. Okay, we'll uh, move along. That was approved unanimous consent or by roll call vote it was unanimous. Review and approval of the December 10th, 2020 draft business meeting minutes. Need a motion. Motion to approve. I have a motion to approve by Bill Amaru. I have a second by Suki Sawyer. Uh, we're going to proceed to roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Aye. Bill Doyle. Yes. Tim Brady. Tim Brady, yes. Khalil Bogdan. Not hearing anything from Khalil. Lou yeah. William. Yes. I, excuse me. Oh, Khalil? Yes, I had to unmute myself. Yes. Okay. Mike Peardnock? Yes. Shelly Edmondson? Yes. December 10, 2020 business meeting minutes have been approved. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Commission members. Moving on, I just want to thank the entire commission, the members of the commission for their attendance. 
uh, once again, uh, it's good to see people are concerned and participate in these meetings. I'd like now to turn this meeting over to Commissioner Ron Amadon. Thank you, Chairman King. Uh, I'll keep my remarks extremely short in the sake of time today. I just want to uh, say I appreciate the Commission's uh, efforts at keeping uh, the meeting uh, on time uh, today, whereas the Division of Marine Fisheries CARES Act team is up for an award this afternoon, and uh, that is an extremely important event. So thank you very much for your understanding and cooperation. Thank you, Commissioner Amadon. Uh, we'll move along now to Director Dan McKinnon for comments. Thank you, Ray. I'd like to thank everyone uh, as you did for their attendance today and for the homework that you all had to do to participate in today's meeting and today's debates. Uh, today's deliberations will be historic and really critically important for for the agency and the commission to achieve its goals of conservation uh, in, along with profitable and safe fisheries. Um, I also want to acknowledge a letter that was received after 5 p.m. last night from an attorney representing some lobstermen. We forwarded the letter to our legal counsel and they've advised us that we can proceed with rulemaking. Um, uh, back to my normal report, uh, CARES funding, uh, I uh, want to call it 1.0 and 2.0. Uh, Ron had mentioned that the CARES team is being honored today by Governor Baker for our uh, performance. Uh, the Carballo Award is given uh, to state employees uh, each year. It's given to 10 persons or groups each year. So it's, uh, it's, it's rare that someone in our department or division would be eligible for this, but they were so pleased with our giving out of the CARES money uh, that they, we were nominated and, and we were awarded and we're gonna meet with the governor this afternoon. That's the good news. The bad news is uh, we have to do it again, but, but I guess that's good news for the industry. There is more CARES money coming. Uh, there's another 300 million that's been uh, allocated uh, by Congress. We may not get the full 28 we got last time because the, in the new uh, rules, there are minimum amounts to, to each state. Uh, and there's also uh, funds, uh, more funds being put aside for uh, Great Lakes states as well as tribes. And so uh, we don't know how much we're going to get. Um, I'm guessing it might be, uh, you know, something in the $20 million range, but uh, it remains to be seen. We'll, we hope to learn more about what kind of allocations we're going to get uh, at an upcoming executive committee meeting of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, where there'll be a presentation by a National Marine Fisheries Service uh, representative. But we do expect the standards of 35% loss due to COVID and the shall not be made more than whole rule also to be maintained. So uh, I'm guessing that, uh, that those businesses that, uh, that were eligible for the last time uh, will probably be eligible for some more funds, assuming that these payments uh, aren't so high uh, in, in aggregate that, um, that the businesses would be making more than what they have reported over the last five years. So it's a work in progress uh, and more to come on that later. Um, the MSI Mass Shellfish Initiative update, uh, th there is a strategic plan working group that is busy and hopes to have a completed document by the end of the week. And that document is expected to go out to public uh, uh, comment. And so uh, we are still on track to getting a shellfish strategic plan completed by the end of March. Uh, the period one winter fluke pilot program began on January 1st. This allows vessels fishing offshore to possess multiple state limits. Uh, and in Massachusetts, 20 vessels have enrolled in the program. Uh, DMF staff are analyzing the state waters ground fish landings for 2020. And next month we'll be providing an overview of the fishery at the February meeting with a proposal for uh, you, many of you commission members will recall, we have this conditional opening um, rule where if uh, we are short on the state water set asides that the New England Council uh, allocates to the states, then uh, we can uh, open for the month of April. And so that'll hang in the balance with, with next month's meeting. Uh, the fisheries work group uh, report for the Mass Ocean Plan was submitted this week to Coastal Zone Management. There was a recreational fishing advisory committee, which was comprised of several of the commission members. Uh, they assisted with the review and the update of the areas of importance for recreational fishing in the state. 
this initiative helps protect those areas from impacts from construction projects. Uh, Welk fishery update, um, we have sanctions, completed sanction against two commercial conquat fishermen uh, that have been enacted through our adjudicatory hearing process. One with a three year suspension for a Nantucket fisherman violating trap limits and a permanent revocation for Martha's Vineyard fishermen uh, for gross violations of the minimum size. This makes the third such case in three years. Um, also this year, 2021 is going to be another uh, gauge increase in the every other year schedule that the commission approved a few years ago. Uh, that's a, a, a every other year gauge increase going through 2029 as we attempt to bring uh, our minimum size in line with the size of maturity. Uh, I also want to announce there's a virtual symposium happening among the East Coast states. It started yesterday with uh, interested parties from each state uh, participating in uh, these Zoom calls to share uh, their science, share their management, share their, their war stories about managing whelk fisheries. And um, it's organized by Virginia Sea Grant and it's, uh, it's been really helpful. It will be helpful for us going forward as we compare and contrast different state management schemes uh, and especially try to uh, account for different life history uh, aspects, uh, especially uh, issues like minimum size. Uh, what we learned yesterday is that uh, this is probably the, one of the most valuable undermanaged species uh, that we have. Um, it's extremely valuable, but in the absence of any interstate or federal plan, uh, it is, uh, it tends to be um, uh, su subject to serial depletion uh, and the fact that as a as a historical uh, it's been historically it's been felt to be a shellfish predator so in a lot of states um, the idea was to eradicate the these predators but with the uh, very highly valuable uh, Asian markets export markets uh, it's carried a lot of fishermen and it's a very important fishery for us uh, now on to the right whale issues. Uh, I want to thank you all for agreeing to this three-week postponement of the January meeting to allow us to invest more time and effort into our recommendations. And I think you can see in the quality of the memos that we wrote uh, about the amount of work uh, really was daunting. And I want to recognize the team of Bob Glenn, Aaron Burke, Jared Silver, and the stats staff led by Anna Webb for all their contributions. Also, the department, the secretary, and the attorney general's legal team that's working with us on the ongoing litigation, all made contributions by reviewing our documents to ensure that we say what we mean and we mean what we say. Good lawyers are by definition good writers and, uh, and good editors. So I really appreciate uh, their help uh, on some of these memos as well. Uh, we could discuss these issues for days. Uh, there's so much history and there's other background issues such as the federal proposed rule and the ongoing litigation. Uh, I think our memo describes much of that background. Uh, but I would urge during this discussion and debate today for the commission to ask any clarifying questions on any of these matters and, and don't be shy. There are no stupid questions. Um, this stuff is complicated and there's a lot of history here as well as a lot of science uh, that's evolving. So we're gonna have Bob Gwen describe the so-called decision support tool first that the National Meat Fishery Service has used to assess our proposals most of our proposals that's come before you today have been reviewed by this decision support tool. Uh, it's a tool that also uh, examines other states' uh, proposals that they brought forward. And then when we get into the, to the meat of the matter, when Bob hands it back to me, we'll take each of the proposals as separate items. So Bob, um, why don't you begin your presentation and, and Jared, if you uh, can assist Bob with that. Bob, you should be able to share your screen as a co-host. Thanks, Jared. Just give me one second to get this fired up. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. Yes. I'm just trying to start the presentation and I'm um, not seeing it. Slideshow. Thank you. There you go. Um, okay. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, I appreciate the, the opportunity to um, discuss with you this morning or to give you a brief presentation 
about the NIMS decision support tool. Uh, the, the importance of this is, is to provide you with some additional context as to what we hope to achieve by the, by the proposed regulations and also how this tool has, has helped guide us in kind of focusing uh, the, regu the proposed regulations to achieve specific risk reductions to protect endangered right whales. Um, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Uh, this, this, uh, a full description of this model is available in the most recently published um, biological opinion uh, in an appendix, uh, its own appendix, because it's it's uh, several hundred pages. It's very complicated. Um, this is this model has been peer reviewed and passed peer review. It is considered um, state of the art and the best available science, and it is what National Marine Fisheries service is using to evaluate any conservation proposals through the TRT team for, for all jurisdictions and states. Um, this model is a Bayesian state space model uh, that's used to uh, evaluate risk to large whales. Um, in its simplest terms, uh, the model incorporates whale density data. So data from all the surveillance efforts up and down the entire East Coast, including our surveillance program that we, we conduct in Cape Cod Bay. Um, that data is used to uh, inform a separate model uh, from Jason Roberts at Duke University that basically takes whale surveillance data and parses it out throughout the, the East Coast or throughout the Atlantic Ocean um, into 10 minute squares to um, estimate whale density per area. So that's one piece of, of input information that this model uses. The second is that it incorporates buoy line data. In the case of Massachusetts, we are at the cutting edge of collecting uh, data from our fishing industry. Our in industry members are very good at filing their reports and supplemental reports. And as a result, we have an unparalleled um, data set that can be used to inform the model uh, based on our buoy line data. Other jurisdictions don't have this and, uh, and they have to rely on expert opinion to make assumptions about gear convention. Like when I say gear convention, I'm talking about um, the proportion of the fleet that fishes singles versus trawls, how big the trawls are and et cetera. Uh, but so the, the two, as I said, the two underlying things are simply whale density and, and, and buoy line data. Uh, the model accounts for the relative risk of gear type, also accounts for the relative get risk of gear type by weighting entanglement severity based on gear convention. So for example, a large diameter rope and with a large number of traps per trawl would be assigned a high severity score, whereas a small diameter rope with a low number of traps per trawl would be assigned a lower severity score. Uh, so it incorporates not only the amount of gear that overlaps with whales, but the type of gear and the, the likelihood to which that that gear, if an entanglement occurs, uh, causes injury to whales. And then simply, not simply, actually very complexly, <laughs> the model calculates the relative risk to large whales based on the co-occurrence of whales and gear. Uh, a really important function of this model is that it can be used to test management scenarios like the proposal uh, today in which I'm going to kind of go over how our, our current proposed regulations uh, performed in the model. Um, so to, to get a, at its base, one of the input data that are, as I mentioned, are buoy line data. Okay, but buoy lines themselves also have a, an important aspect, which is a time component component. So the number of buoy lines that mass fishermen um, deploy is one aspect of it, but it, what, what actually of risk to whales is how long they're in the water. So you come up with a, a parameter called buoy line days. And it's quite simply, that's just the number of buoys times the number of days they're in the water. And here you can see how they're broken down by month. And this is what, what we would consider a potential risk landscape. Note I said potential because buoy line are only risky to whales when whales are there. And so if there aren't any whales there, you don't have risk. So this would be our potential risk landscape. And as you would expect, you have fairly low risk in the winter months um, because combination of things is because we do have a closure, but also historically that, that time of year is a time period when effort is particularly low because a lot of fishermen don't fish that time of year. 
And then as you would expect in the spring and into the summer, effort increases, peaking in August, declines through the fall and into the winter. The other important aspect in the whale model as I indicated was whale density. This whale density is based on estimates from the Duke University whale density model. And it, this is for specifically for Massachusetts waters. And this is kind of the monthly breakdown of our whale density score. And you can see in, based on the, this information that prim, our primarily our whale season prim, where we have densities of whales are, is primarily the months of January through May. You notice I've circled the month of December here. Um, when we were, were reviewing this data and saw this, this really popped out in our heads because based on raw surveillance data from our surveys, we, we understand that while some whales do show up in December, they're, they're fairly, um, they're typically not very many. And many of the survey efforts in December, December will turn up zero whales. So we only have a handful of whales at that time of the year. Yet the model density density model here is predicting that the density in December would be similar to January, which based you know on discussions from our institutional knowledge as well as folks from CCS that just doesn't ring true with what we know. So we did a little bit of a deeper dive. Uh, I contacted Jason Roberts from uh, Duke University, and basically what we found out is at the time when this well density model was um, put together, they had a difficult time with current methods available to them estimating the density in December because overall our survey effort in that month was fairly low. However, since that time, Jason indicated that they do have the ability now to, to provide a robust density estimate for, uh, for December. Historically, what they did was because they didn't really know, uh, or they didn't have a good tool to estimate density for that month, they just assumed that the density in December was the same as it was in Jan January. And that's why you see this. So this, this point will influence the, the monthly breakdown, but I, you know, I, for, at this time, I would just say disregard this. Um, we would expect that the whale density is going to be substantially lower in, de in, in density. Uh, Jason Roberts and NIMS are aware of this. They're working on an updated estimate. And so um, this, this will be accounted for. So when you overlay uh, the amount of gear and the amount of whales, um, you have what, what's called co-occurrence. And this is what I would consider our realized risk landscape. Because as I said, you only have risk when whales and fishing gear overlap. And again, I'm going to ask you to continue to disregard the December month. But in general, what you see here is our risk, our primary risk occurs through the months of January through May. And that, that risk is based on the amount of gear that has the potential to interact with a lot of whales at around the time of year. You also see in the months of June through November, extraordinarily low amount of risk to whales. Um, yet that, that's at a time when our gear density is at its highest, which tells us that based on the data, there are very, very few whales around in the summertime period and in and, and early fall. And as a result of that, we have a very low realized risk landscape. So by lo looking at these monthly plots, we can kind of, uh, it helps us kind of determine where we need to focus management efforts. And so you can see from Massachusetts, the very most important time of year clearly is, is the months of April and May. And then to a lesser extent, um, uh, uh, February and March. Um, February and March have high whale density, but not the high, but lower, much lower gear density. So then um, the model can calculate the relative risk based on different scenarios. The, the figure on the left demonstrates our relative risk in the absence of any of the regulations that are proposed. And this would also be in, in the absence of the, the current Cape Cod Bay closure or Mass Bay restricted area closure rather. And you can see it as I as we expect those those months of the winter months through January through May are extremely high in risk score overall. To the right is relative risk in scenario one. Scenario one is the baseline scenario. That is basically our our risk reduction. I mean, I'm, excuse me. That is the 
regulations package um, that we went out to public hearing with in its whole, the, the original baseline pack of all the regulations. And as you can see, as a result of the, of the closures, as well as the result of the um, reduced buoy line strength, the ban on singles, um, the entire regulation package put into the model, it shows that it dramatically would decrease our risk, uh, relative risk throughout all the months. Um, and again, I, I will point out that I anticipate once the December data is updated that that point will look very much like, um, you know, Jan I would expect the relative risk to be on the magnitude of January or lower than January, so it'd be very small. So I mean, this helps us and also demonstrates the National Marine Fishery Service show that the regulations that we proposed are likely to dramatically enhance um, conservation to right whales, or in this case, reduce the risk of entanglement to right whales. If you break down the scenario in total, uh, that risk reduction scenario for all the regulations package would reduce the risk to right whales by 74.6%, um, which is substantially higher than what's being required to the take reduction team, um, the 60%. Uh, and, and this is, you know, this is focused at us trying to um, go beyond the base, what, what's being required by NIMS to, to basically achieve our, our incidental take permit. If you break this down by month, you, this just gives the percent reduction per month. And so you can see in the months where the, we have the closure in February through May, we've eliminated the risk by 100% which makes sense because we're, we would be taking all the buoy lines out of the water in those months and that would that completely reduces risk. The other months you can see hover around about a 20 percent reduction in risk and that is relative to changes in uh, re one removing singles, two making the gear um, less risky to whales by uh, requiring 1700 pound line or contrivance um, and, and the other management measure suite. Um, we did ask National Marine Fishery Service to look, based on feedback we got from public comment, um, we asked, which Jared will go through in more detail later, we asked, um, oh, I'm sorry, Dan will go through more detail later. We asked NIMS to look at four different scenarios. And these scenarios are um, based on the feedback that we got through public hearing. So they include um, the baseline, which, are, which was the, the, the pa regulation package, uh, what I call the Southern New England exemption, which is similar to the, 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 the baseline scenario, except it doesn't, I asked them to look at the effects of not closing the water south of Cape Cod in state waters during that time period. And you can see, uh, based on this, and Dan highlights in his memo, there's only a very small, um, like a 1.4% 1, 1. Uh, reduction in risk when we, in risk reduction when we, we don't close that area. Um, we had several requests by conservation groups to, in scenario three, to, in, to in, uh, close the month of January to protect right whales. Um, this only increased the relative, the risk reduction up to 77.7%. Uh, so only about a 3% gain by closing the entire month of January. So not very much. And then the final one was just a hybrid scenario whereby we closed January, but not including the Southern New England and, and that fell, fell somewhere in between. And I, I can certainly answer more questions on that if, if folks are interested. Um, we did have an opportunity to, to go over these results with National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, generally, they were pleased with the outcome of all four scenarios. At this point, they cannot tell us the exact percent risk reduction necessary for us to achieve a negligible impact determination um, because they have not generated mass lobster fishery specific mortality estimates or, or PVR estimates. Um, so the, the, the negligible impact determination is what we would need to achieve in order for them to issue us a incidental take permit. Um, but in general, they indicated they were encouraged um, and that we were on the right path and that um, they you know, potentially have the, the ability to issue us an ITP. Um, and then the way it works is they have the options in the future, but they view the initial ITP as not being sufficient. They can reevaluate it and, and ask us to do more. Um, 
So that was really kind of the Cliff Notes version of the model. And in the interest of being brief, um, I, you know, I try to keep the presentation fairly short. But with that, I will, um, I'll give it back to Dan. And certainly, uh, I'm, I'm willing to entertain any questions as deemed appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, that was really uh, very clearly presented, and, and I really appreciate you doing it in that fashion. I think it's it may be appropriate for some commission questions because it's it is technical. It's the first time they've seen this model, and, and there may be some clarifying questions. Are there Mr. any commission? Chair, do you want to proceed to questions? Yeah. Suki. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bob. Was that co-occurrence, those high co-occurrence percentages before the uh, Cape Cod closure? Is that why the number is so high? I can't believe they're that high if you count the closure in there in those months. I have another question too. Can you hear me, Jerry? I can. Bob, did you get that? I apologize. I was muted. Jared, I was just asking if I could just quickly have uh, you want the, the screen, screen back the screen back so I can answer uh, all you yours. Question. Thank you. Okay, so Suki was asking about all those high current current scores are are um, occurred in, account for the closure. And, in, and no, they, they don't. And so in the, in, if you look, here's the co-occurrence score uh, in green. Um, and it, this is our, what our, our realized risk landscape is. So this means in the absence of any regulations, including the closure. And if you look at that in comparison, the one on the left in this, on the screen shows what it looks like in the absence of the closure. The one on the right includes the the historical closure, as well as the expansion of the closure into, uh, you know, all mass waters. Uh, and so you can see that that regulation package essentially wiped out the risk entirely from February through May and dramatically decreased it um, in, in the other months. It's hard to see that the effect that it has on the summer months because there are the risk is fairly low. But what risk there was, it did in, in, in reduce it on average by 20% as well in those months. So, Bob, this is Dan. If I could intervene here. Uh, Suki's question, uh, I think, sa is, is essentially on the left-hand side, those two large uh, peaks in April and May, uh, those, were, uh, those were, in essence, uh, modeled without the closure we've had for the last five years. And we are continuing to benefit from that closure, right? Correct. Yeah. So certainly it's, it's pre-closure. It's when, when I say closure, it's the Mass Bay restricted area closure that's been in effect for six years. I, I understand that, uh, Dan and Bob. I just want to know what the risk is, accounting, including the closure. We're talking about North Shore here. We're not talking about Cape Cod Bay anymore. So I don't understand why we're talking about the co-occurrence you know, not being present in Cape Cod Bay. I want to see what the North Shore adds to the co-occurrence because co-occurrence is questionable up here. We had an anomaly a few years ago with a bunch of right whales went up by here, but before that and since then, I don't think the co-occurrence is that high up here, but you're not showing that to us. Yeah, so I don't have it broken down just for um, one small area, Suki. I have it just the you only know, way the model gives the data is just for the entire state. But what you're, I think what you'd want to see or you're asking for is what, uh, what it would look like with the historical closure versus what it would look like with the expanded closure specifically. Yeah, that's um, right. I want to see what the nice. I, I don't have, I don't have figures in front of me that to show the monthly breakdown but I can say based on the work we did with the Atlantic large whale take reduction team and the initial proposal we sent, uh, that got us to around uh, just over 60%, right around 60% that was required. And with the new additions, it's getting us up around close to 75. So it's, overall, it's about a 15% you know, increase in the risk reduction. Okay, I just wish we could see the co-occurrence on the North Shore because the co-occurrence was questioned by some of the environmental groups at the 
couple of uh, meetings ago, and I'm, I wasn't sure we were using co-occurrence stuff anymore, but I understand what happened at the wheel meeting. Okay, thank you. Chair Williams. Williams. Lou, you're on mute. Yeah, there you go. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, Bob, I just had a couple of questions on what we're going forward here with. And um, I'm just looking at this closure. Um, number one, correct me if I'm wrong, this, let's say it's implemented. There's no guarantee we're going to get the state certificate from NOAA, correct? I have no guarantees um, on the, on whether or not we get the take permit. No, um, I, I only have that they were, again, they were encouraged by the, the results and generally encouraged us to proceed. So I, yeah. I think we have a good chance of success, um, but I wouldn't, I, you know, clearly I'm not in a position to guarantee it. Right now that this is, this is my concern um, because uh, I see this, I, I've just been through too much of this stuff and uh I can see this certificate going, oh, well, this, this is great. I've heard it so many times. This is great, but and then the butt comes in. And I just really see us going down a road here, possibly where it's, oh, yeah, you can get it if we close December and January, too. You know, this is, this is my concern about this. This thing's going to just, uh, just take on a life of its own to get to that point. And um, I just want to voice that concern because um, I looked at the federal plan, what they just came out with. And there was no, no talk of closing anything up here on the North shore, you know? Um, and uh, I just want, you know, everyone on the commission to understand what we're doing here. And we could just put more, more regulations, more hardships on the fishery and get no return for it. And that's a definite possibility. I just want everyone to understand that. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any further questions on Bob's presentation. I'm going to put the agenda back up for you. Ray, I'd be prepared to um, bring up the recommendation slides uh, one at a time and uh, have the commission discuss, discuss each of them uh, as uh, on its merits and make a motion based on uh, the discussion. Okay, so so that the commission understands this is an action item and we, we will be voting on uh, recommendations one by one. Is that understood amongst the commission members? This is an action item. I'm not seeing any hands raised indicating that there's any questions on that point. Director McKeon, you have the floor. All right, thank you, Ray. Uh, Jared. One if you, moment. You can bring up those slides. So, so thank you, uh, uh, Ray, and, uh, and thanks, Jared, for bringing these up. So um, I just have some summary slides. Uh, many of them you'll recognize from the uh, public uh, uh, hearing that we held uh, back in December. Uh, we all know that, that right whales have declined uh, substantially uh, in the last uh, you know, 10 years or so. I will say that when I started in this game, there were under 300. Um, it's all consolation, but um, you know, we, we, think we, we think we can reverse this trend. Uh, we are 14 new calves this year, and there's a whole lot of new uh, conservation measures going in. So I think we should all be optimistic going forward. Um, uh, I don't want to get into the unusual mortality event. I think it's well established, but we do know that there was a lot of deaths uh, that occurred uh, th throughout the range, but especially in Canada. And uh, it got everybody's attention. And, and uh, we've been at this for two years trying to figure out a, a new round of rulemaking. So uh, Jared, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I want to remind the commission that, uh, as Bob has talked about, the large whale take reduction team has been going at this for 25 years. I served on that team uh, at the beginning uh, on behalf of DMF 
at the time, I was probably the most knowledgeable DMF person about the lobster fishery, but uh, clearly uh, that's, that's no longer the case. And I'm really uh, uh, you know, grateful. You know, Bob has stepped into that role and he's done a great job. Um, the, uh, the proposed rules that NIMS has put on the streets uh, are open for public comment over the, these, this two, two month uh, period. And, um, and also what's interesting is the, there's a, a recent biological opinion that has been published by the National Marine Fishery Service. And it concerns their federal fisheries and whether or not the fisheries are causing jeopardy. And uh, they, uh, in their draft opinion, they've declared that uh, a lot, as a result of these regulations, uh, that the federal fisheries will not be causing jeopardy. And, um, and as a result, uh, we are dealing with the state fisheries here uh, and we're hoping for a, a similar uh, treatment by the National Marine Fishery Service through the adoption of, of some of these extra measures. Um, so, uh, you know, staff is working very hard uh, on this incidental take permit application. It is a long drawn out process. The court ordered us to get an ITP within 90 days back in April, but uh, we've, we soon learned uh, that, that such a process takes about two years. Uh, I will remind the commission that we are scheduled to go to trial in June of 2021. So uh, it, it is important um, for us to be able to go into that trial uh, with the most uh, ammunition we have. And I, and I think uh, adopting, uh, you know, most or if not all of these rules certainly uh, helps, that, helps us in that regard. Um, so like I said, the ITP application is going on. Uh, one of the features is a habitat conservation plan where any state that, that goes down this road uh, has to uh, develop uh, extra conservation measures and, and uh, ways to mitigate uh, the, for potential takes. Uh, I, we did have, uh, in the last 10 years, we did have one documented uh, take of a right whale. It was a, uh, it was a, a right whale that picked up some uh, lobster gear, uh, apparently in state, uh, in state waters, and this comes from the National Marine Fishery Service records. Uh, the disentanglement occurred out in the federal zone. It was a, a successful disentanglement, and, um, and, and that's been the only uh, case that we know of, and it happened in the month of September. So we do have a very uh, strong program. It is funded by the National Marine Fishery Service and the Mass Environmental Trust, those who bring you the, uh, the whale plate. Uh, they do dedicate, I think about $200,000 a year. Um, if, if that number is different, I'll ask Aaron Burke to, to speak up. Uh, but um, this program not only provides the surveillance that we are, are enjoying is, is all season uh, uh, when the whales are here, but also the disentanglement program, should whales show up here uh, entangled and uh, far more uh, you know, whales show up entangled uh, we know that for a fact, and then would ever get entangled here because uh, these whales can carry gear a long, a long distance. So um, again, uh, Bob's worked very closely and has gotten great cooperation from the National Marine Fisheries Service modelers to uh, fine tune, uh, not just the model, but fine tune some of the, uh, the uh, proposals going in to determine uh, overall risk reduction. And my final comment is uh, in the ITP, it has to address the takes of any endangered species. Uh, and there's two for the lobster fishery uh, and also for some of our other pot fisheries down south, and that is uh, leatherback turtles. And we're gonna be dealing with that separately uh, in the near future. So public comment came in, uh, hot and heavy, never seen anything like it, at least in, in, uh, in, in my you know, uh, recent years as, as deputy or as director. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of comments come in on some past issues back in the 70s and 80s, but but this is probably a record in, in our more modern times. Uh, we had uh, well in, a, in, a, in excess of 200 people on each of the Zoom calls. Uh, it is an issue that's gotten a lot of people's attention, um, and uh, we had a lot of comments comments on the timing, uh, comments on the potential for exempting uh, waters to our west you know, down to Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound, uh, the so-called Area 2 fishery, uh, some opposition to the recreational trap uh, closure from a few folks, uh, some confusion and comments on the, the so-called breaking strength and contrivances, you know, how many do you need uh, and where, and then um, the, the issue of single trap fishing in certain waters uh, was also a very uh, 
a very passionate uh, uh, issue for a lot of folks, and we got a lot of comments on those. Uh, we got in excess of, of 2,000 uh, comments just on ropeless fishing, which is a technology that, uh, that is uh, being tested around the world um, and, uh, and, uh, and around the country, uh, but is clearly not ready for, for prime time, uh, given the, the challenges of, of being able to detect the gear and also the cost. So, uh, and, and you probably have seen not only in, in my companion memo, but also in a advisory that was put out to the public that the Division of Marine Fisheries is in the process of uh, conducting a, um, a, a survey or developing a white paper on exactly what the challenges are for ropeless fishing. Like what are the unintended consequences? What are the issues that have to be resolved? Because as I mentioned in my companion memo, it is not difficult uh, to put something over the side and, and have it uh, be brought brought up with a, a remotely controlled uh, uh, you know, buoy, an on-demand buoy. That's, that's something that oceanographers have, have mastered for decades. That is not hard. It's expensive, but it's not hard. What's hard is uh, arranging a fishery where fishermen can coexist with one another, lobstermen and lobstermen, or lobstermen versus scallopers and draggers and, and surf climbers when the gear can't be seen. And so that is a, uh, that is a huge problem. And that is one thing that uh, that the federal government is going to have to deal with, as well as um, as, as us, as as a as an agency and as a commission. Um, you know, should should the uh, there be interest in, in this going forward? Uh, so that brings me to to today's uh, first proposal. Uh, the proposal was uh, to uh, extend the the Mass Bay restricted area, which is the pink area on this map. Uh, to extend that to all state waters, uh, February through April, and um, and retain the authority to extend uh, the closure if if whales remained in the bay, uh, we did get a lot of comments on this, uh, especially among the, uh, the the lobstermen in the in the south uh, and, and and in the west. Now, I will grant that this is not a very substantial lobster fishery. It may be important to those who are involved in it, but there's probably only about 75 or so active lobstermen in area two um, compared to about six or 700 in area one. Uh, but the, the timing of, of this was, was challenging. As you know, uh, lobsters like cooler water, uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, fishery down in this area has been in such decline. And if there is a, a time and, and that it, the catches are probably somewhat higher, it would be in the spring because of the cool water before some of those lobsters would move out. Um, so we got some, some concerns and objections because they claim that there simply isn't uh, enough documentation of, of whales in this area. And Bob uh, has, has went to the folks at NEMS and uh, ask them to rerun the model uh, with an exemption for that so-called uh, area two, for the area two lobster fleet. Um, so we are um, uh, prepared to propose uh, us, that measure, exempting the, the, the area to the west. Uh, I'll let Bob speak to the risk reduction or the risk enhancement if we were to, uh, to do this, uh, to exempt that area. Um, but we also uh, really took heed to the comments about the month of, of May. And Bob showed how uh, you know, May, May is a risky one for us because we, we have such a large aggregation of whales in Cape Cod Bay that peaks, uh, you know, I, I often liken it to a, a, uh, like, a, like a fireworks display that, that builds up, builds up, builds up, and then you get this, this finale and, and uh, you know, we, we've often gotten between 100 and 200 whales a day uh, in, in Cape Cod Bay in the last few years. It's just stunning, the, the level of whales that we get in that area. And when they leave the bay, they, as, as Suki mentioned earlier, you know, an, an anomaly of the past few years ago, when they do leave the bay, they, 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 they can travel up off of Boston. They, they can, uh, they have been seen uh, at least in one year off Cape Ann. And, um, and that's the part that, that makes us a little bit nervous because um, the whales typically are gonna go offshore and they're gonna go north, but uh, they have been known to meander 
to uh, the Mass Bay uh, and Cape Ann areas, however brief, we don't have any um, documented aggregations of right whales uh, in that Cape Ann area, like all season long, like we do in Cape Cod Bay. So this is really about, you know, as they're leaving, where are they going? And we have had records in, in Mass Bay and around Cape Ann where they've, they've lingered for, for some number of days. And that's typically in April. And so uh, what we're proposing, oh, and also I want to mention that the, the, the May uh, 1st to the May 15th period, in four of the last six years, we've had whales stay um, a little bit longer. And, uh, you know, it's been stressful. Uh, a lot of fishermen have been, you know, calling us and waiting on our every word. And we're asking the Center for Coastal Studies to fly. And we've had to make judgment calls to keep the area closed. And, um, and it's, it's been hard. And, I, and I, I feel for the fishermen who just want to go to work, you know, and, and they don't want to be, you know, calling DMF to ask them when they can go to work. So I think it's a smarter approach to um, use the data of the last four years and, and call that uh, the closure um, through May 15th, because uh, we've had whales up till I think May 14th in one year. Uh, my recommendation is to close that and to use the surveillance to open it um, uh, as a default. And, and the reason I like that is the, uh, these overflights can be, can be challenging. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to put uh, a lot of pressure on the um, on the surveillance team. Uh, often, you know, if, if you can have a calm day, but if it's foggy, it, you can't see anything. You can have a sunny, bright day, but if it's too windy, you can't see anything. And in those conditions, you know, we just want to make sure the whales have left. So I think it's a safer approach uh, to to take this uh, closure to May fifteenth and also um, to use the authority to open that area. Now that's possible because the National Fisheries Service does not have a complementary closure after May 1st. So it's not like the, the federal rules are gonna trump the state rules. As far as the, the, uh, the extension to, to Mass Bay and to, up to Ipswich Bay, I understand uh, you know, that, that this is objectionable, uh, especially for fishermen who like to fish in the spring. All I can say is, um, We've asked the, the governor's office for enhanced revenues in future years to do extra surveillance and so that we can ensure that the whales uh, are not present. And if, if we have a, a normal year where the whales are gone in the fourth week of April, then all these areas will open. And, and I, I promise that. So, um, so I don't know, Bob, do you want to speak to uh, what the risk uh, increase is uh, if we were to exempt the so-called area two, which is the blue area on the map? Yeah, by exempting that area, we only change the risk score by about 1.3%, um, which you know makes sense based on our knowledge that that, that area has virtually no whales in it uh, historically. So um, it's it doesn't... Um, yeah, that about 1.3 percent. I'll leave it at that. Okay, and I think in in future rulemaking, uh, federal rulemaking, there's going to be a, a closure south of Nantucket that will probably um, include a piece of the state waters. So, um, well, we may have to amend that in the future. So there may be a piece of that that is going to be closed by the federal government. But for now, we just you know most of the lobstering that goes on. And the area around, say, you know, Chilmark or the Elizabeth Islands, uh, would be able to continue, uh, you know, in in April, and uh, which is uh, when those guys want to get out. So, so that that is uh, that is our recommendation. And so, uh, I think it'd be best if the commission discussed uh, the 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 the, uh, the benefits of that, or or on its on its uh, you know, just just have a discussion and then. What we'll do is we'll put up a formal motion that uh, a commission commission members look at and then uh, amend or, or or ask me to amend if it's if it's not acceptable. Questions for DMF from commission. I have a question. This is Bill Amaru. Bill, you're okay, right. Bill, thank you, uh, Dan. Thank you very much for that description. And I have a question for Bob Glenn. Bob, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Bill. Okay. If you took the blue colored area south of the Cape surrounding the islands and applied that same color to the red zone 
on the North Shore, what would the percentage of increase be? You have given us the percentage of reduction for the area or increase for um, allowing a fishery in the southern area. What would it be if you went up to the north and made that North Shore area blue? I, I don't have that analysis right in front of me, Bill, uh, specifically. But I can tell you is 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 based on the the credit that we got for the original conservation proposal to the TRT, which would just be the pink area, that got us around 60%. By going to the red area, it gets us to about 74%. So it's an increase uh, of a, on the order of magnitude of, of 12 to 14%. 12 to 14%. Dan, you've, you've made the statement that you would apply a lot of uh, your talents to determining whether or not whales went into that zone and allow the fishermen to go in there if there were no whales, correct? Yes. We're talking aerial surveillance. Right. Uh, we have routine surveillance in Cape Cod Bay, but when the whales leave the bay or even while they're still there, if we have extra flight time, we've often asked coastal studies to um, venture uh, outside of the bay, um, especially uh, above Mass Bay area to make sure that you know the the hundred or so whales that uh, were in the bay uh, aren't feeding you know off the Boston Harbor Islands at some point right so that's that's the risky part that we want to avoid. Yeah, all right. Well, I find that that area to the north, uh, colored in red, it, it um, troubles me. Uh, I could support everything except what I see up there on the North Shore. Thank you. Mike Pierdenock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, as Dan, you mentioned, uh, there could be an unusual event uh, with climatic shift and increased water temperatures. So my, my question is that let, let's say the right whales go into Cape Cod Bay uh, early April and uh, they leave in mid-April. Does this measure provide the ability to lift that closure or is that lifting uh, only limited to May 1st to the 15th and and, and that, that that therefore that has to do with that if we do have an unusual event that they enter and leave earlier than the timeline thanks yeah the pink area uh, only uh, because there's a, com a complementary federal rule in the pink area that area can be um, only opened in the first 15 days of May the because there isn't a comparable rule north of that area in the red area, then, then there's no complementary federal rule, therefore we could open that sooner. But I just want to explain um, you know, the, the perspective of, of, of regulating this uh, and, and you know, what we know about lobster fishing. We've always told the world that you, you can't do an instantaneous closure to lobster gear because most boats can't get out fast enough or they can't move their gear quick enough, especially with the small boat fleet that we have. And what, what the reason we're proposing this is um, if, if gear is, is left there and the, and the whales meander out of Cape Cod Bay into Mass Bay, the gear is already there. We, we can't do what we can do in Cape Cod Bay by saying, hey, we're going to extend the closure another few days while the whales leave. If the closure never exists, then you can't, then you can't reasonably ask the fishermen to, to abide by a closure because they are physically unable to, to move the gear. So that's why we're proposing to establish this, this three month um, common closure uh, from Cape Cod to, to, the, to the New Hampshire border because if the whales are there um, on May 1st, we can keep the area closed. But, or even if the whales show up there in late April, I, I, I don't have the, 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 the means. I guess too, I could use some emergency authority, but it's not reasonable to ask the lobstermen to move the gear if they're unable to do it between weather and also the, the fact that most guys can't move their gear uh, quickly enough. Sookie? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Jared. Uh, uh, Dan and Bob, I understand what the dilemma the state is facing right now as far as this lawsuit goes. 
I just have a hard time swallowing that the North Shore closure is going to really have a big effect on the right whale population. We, we all heard at the last whale team meeting, Zoom meeting, a couple weeks ago, uh, no official claimed that there was no documented deaths by United States lobster gear in the last five years. So if that being the case, most of the deaths have occurred in Canada in the last in, the, in this period of time where the whales of the population has gone down. I just can't accept the fact that the North Shore has to do all this work to bring all this gear in and put it back out again when there's no, no real gain for the lobster, I mean, for the right whale population. Thanks. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any further questions from Go oh, Lou. Yeah, uh, excuse me. May I ask a yeah. question? Uh, yeah, you hear me, Jared? I can, Lou. Khalil, I'll get to you next. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, last year, when we started talking about this, uh, from a commonsensical point of view, I was all for it. I said, okay, there's right whales here. If this takes care of the problem, it goes away, and we can just, then the guys can go to work. That's fine. But I'll be honest, in December, two afternoons, I listened to the uh, public comment. And again, it's that. Uh, it was like this This was nothing. This is, a, this is a huge undertaking for the fleet. But to the respondents on there from the environmental side of things, it was like, oh, yeah, that's great. But <clears throat> And I just see us, again, putting all this regulations in. And let's say we pass this. Doesn't guarantee we get a take certificate from Noah. I don't think they'll give it to us. Um, I don't think seventy-four percent. I know how these people operate. Seventy-four percent is going to be enough. They say, "Oh, that's that's great," and then we get the butt. But we really wanted one hundred percent, and that's ropeless, 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 ropeless. That's all I heard. So, <clears throat> so up until listening to those public comments, I was in favor of this. But after listening to those public comments, and this is to them, to the to the environmental side of this issue. This closure means nothing. I, 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 I don't feel like I can't support it, you know. Um, and here we are at the end of January. We're we going to tell guys to bring their gear in by the middle, I saw middle of February or beginning of March. It's, it's February, for God's sake, you know. Uh, and and that's a, that's, that could put an onus on a lot of guys to try to get the gear in and put in, put in the weather days. In. They shouldn't, you know. When you bring your gear home, you should be able to pick the days you want to go put load your boat with traps. And it shouldn't be in, in, uh, uh, mandated very quickly in a two-week period. It's not like it's July. So, <clears throat> so from my point of view now, totally flipped on this uh, because even with the feds, the feds came out with their plan and uh, uh, recommendations there last month and, and, and right in it, they said they're looking for rope lists within five years. So that's going to be the, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> the end all for this rope list number one this is going to mean nothing you know uh this closure uh, i think that's where it's going to end up so i just my, myself personally i just like i said from a common sense point of view it was the right thing to do but like i said after listening to the public comments uh we're going to just put a, another onerous regulation on the industry that's going to gain us nothing and uh in the, in the scope of things and that's just my personal feelings on it. So, um, but anyhow, I just kind of want to make that comment on this. Thanks. Khalil? Yes, thank you, Jared. I appreciate it. Um, one's one's going to be a, a, a point that I want to make. And the second will be a question, I guess, for Dan. And, uh, you know, coming to decisions today is, is not going to be an easy task. Uh, there's a lot of hard work went into putting the proposal together. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we have a couple of factors facing us. And one of them is the Endangered Species Act, both federal and state, that we have to adhere to and to um, work on. And the second, second is that you know, we have a lawsuit facing us to enforce the, the Endangered Species Act in Massachusetts, uh, and, and as Dan said, there's going to be, uh, I guess, uh, a trial or whatever is going to happen in June. And Dan, my question would be, listening to a couple of the conversations here, uh, I, I, I and 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 also, 
Bob's explanation about the percentages of, you know, gain by uh, closing, you know, west of, uh, uh, south of uh, Cape Cod, that, that, that blue hash mark area. Um, if, if in fact, if in fact we were to modify the, the closure for all of area one and, and, and open up that red area as Bill Amaral had said previously, uh, how would that affect by doing that? And, and, I, and I, I do understand traps go out and whales show up that it's gonna be tough to, to mobilize the fleet to get all the lines out of there. But I'm just curious as to the logistics of this lawsuit, if in fact, uh, we're, we're proposing to close area one. Uh, if we were to modify that, would that affect the lawsuit at all? Well, yeah, um, I, I think it would. Um, you know, the, the lawsuit uh, attempts to uh, or ask the judge to issue a temporary restraining order to halt DMF from licensing the use of vertical buoy lines which you know, we just think that that is an existential threat to the fisheries as currently constituted. We don't think that uh, a three month closure when 2% of the annual landings come in to our ports uh, is an existential threat to, the, to this fishery. And we are hopeful that uh, going forward, we're gonna be able to make the case to the National Marine Fishery Service to achieve an incidental take permit and we are hopeful, and I'm going to predict that uh, Bob Glenn is going to be on the stand in June in a federal court, and maybe making some of the same um, arguments and, and descriptions of analyses that we've made here today. Um, I I would uh, ask uh, the majority of the commission members to uh, to really uh, consider the the larger fate of the lobster fishery in in voting here, because uh, we think this is surgical, and we think. It's appropriate, and as far as uh, Lou, I understand, you know, your frustration uh, listening to the, some of those comments. I was also taken aback by the by all this uh, ropeless in five years, or ropeless tomorrow, or ropeless now. Um, but our audience is not them. Our audience at this point is the National Marine Fisheries Service, and come uh, early June, a federal judge. And so, uh, we think this is the most responsible way to manage this fishery um, as. Currently, it is uh, reminiscent of um, of the way California is is dealing with the fishery, where you know they have uh, shortened their season when they think whales uh, might be around. Uh, as far as ropeless goes, uh, it's it's all experimental and it's only for during the, the closed season. Um, so uh, I agree with you that uh, if if this is a march toward that kind of technology, then then it is it is. Uh, it is going to be very difficult for the industry uh, at, at that point. But I think this is a battle today that is worth uh, fighting. And I would ask the majority of the commission members to consider um, approving this uh, for the benefit of the, of the fishery as it exists today. We, we, I think the fishery can withstand this, this closure. Um, and I'll do everything I can to keep the closure to a minimum. Thank you, Director. I appreciate it. Mike Beardnock. Uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, if uh, you were not to include the closure of the uh, areas in the North Shore of the Red Area, uh, my question is that that assumption, I assume, is in the model that Bob uh, described earlier. So if you were to remove it, what would be the outcome of, of the model? For the conclusions of the model, or am I looking at this incorrectly? Thank if you. We, if we were not to include the North Shore closure, essentially we would be back at around 60%, um, which is what was mandated by the, the, the take reduction team, and which is part of the current uh, regulations being posed by NIMS. The pink area is already federal law and in has analogous state um, regulations to support it. So the, the only thing that would be new here would be the addition of the red. Um, and so in the, the absence of that, we would not be able to demonstrate to National Marine Fishery Service uh, any additional conservation measures in our incidental take permit application. Well, thank you.
I have a comment to Bill Amaro and a question. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dan, I'm sympathetic to your position and what you're asking us. We're going to be making a recommendation to you. Ultimately, it's the division's responsibility to make the choice. Uh, well, Bill, I keep going. Clarify, if I could, um, yeah. it's my, my job is to recommend and your job is to approve. And if you, if you don't approve, then, then we don't get it. So, um, so shortly I'll put up a motion that you could make, but I, I can't do this without your, your approval. Because Can we amend the, the motion that you're going to put up? Yes. All right. And only you can amend a motion. Well, they, it's, it's true. They, you, can, you can look at this motion and, and, and urge me to amend it, uh, but, but I'll be listening to you very carefully. Okay. Um, I'm going to just say that I, I feel as though this generation of fishermen who are going to be affected by these rules and regulations had nothing to do with the uh, right whale situation. That was determined 200 years ago. And all of the uh, resultant angst over this animal is currently being generated by our culture and our commerce on the East Coast of the United States and Canada. 40 to 50 million people are the reason that we have a problem with right whale recovery. The amount of interaction with our state waters lobster fleet, where there's been one known entanglement and that whale was disentangled and survived, to ask the industry to continue to bear the burden of something that it seems will not have any impact uh, in the long or short run on the survival of this species just is, it runs against my grain. And I try to do what I can as a responsible citizen and as a fisherman to help uh, in this situation. But it, it seems to me that we just keep blowing more and more smoke and we get very little fire out of what we do. And there's a lot of fishermen in this area that are gonna be affected. These other regulations that are coming down the pike are gonna be catastrophic. And I think that ropeless is gonna be one of them we're gonna be dealing with. And by the time we get to that, uh, it, it's going to be more than the, the fleet can withstand. So at any rate, I'm going to listen to what uh, you propose for us, Dan, and look at the uh, motion and see how it goes. Why don't we proceed to the next slide, Jared? Mike Piernock has his hand up. Okay. Uh, after that, um, I just wanted to bring to the chair's attention. It is now 1010. We have um, 50 more minutes dedicated to this action item and uh, five additional recommendations. Mike, you're recognized. Mike Piernog. Uh There we go. Thank you, Jared. Uh, I, I, just to expand on what was just noted earlier, if I understand this properly, you, uh, if you do not include that red area to closure, then you will not fulfill the requirements required uh, by a National Marine Fishery Service to do what's achieved for the reduction. Uh, if you were to do such, what would occur? Yeah, Bob, why don't you speak to uh, the fact that we actually don't have a clear target, but we're trying to um, create this extra uh, level of, of risk reduction. Yeah, <clears throat> so essentially um, one of the challenging parts about trying to um, apply for and obtain an incidental take permit in this in this case is NIMS is not able to tell us the exact percent reduction required to achieve what's called a negligible impact determination. In this case, when they review their permit, the protected species office in Silver Springs is the sole judge and jury of our application. It's our job in the habitat conservation plan to hut to describe our fishery highlight all aspects of where potential risks to whales are, and then provide mitigation for those risks. Um, while I cannot predict exactly because I what their re reaction would be, this particular closure is kind of the, the foundation uh, of our incidental take permit in addressing the, the additional risk. So in the absence of it, my opinion is that our, our potential for success in the the 
incidental take permit application would be severely handicapped. And I'd like to add, if I could, that um, while we've had a successful closure uh, in the Cape Cod Bay and out of Cape area, in those instances where we've had uh, whales uh, in Mass Bay and off Cape Ann, um, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's made me nervous. Now, I, I know that during those months, there isn't a lot of gear because as I already mentioned, there's only 2% of the landings that come in during those months. But uh, I don't, as a manager, I don't feel like I can resolve the risk because uh, the gear's already there. And, we, and as, as folks on the call have noted, that lobstermen, uh, you know, in the in the lousy months, and they just can't get out there. So we just think that this is um, a, one area of vulnerability that we'd like to um, to wrap up um, as we go forward to try to to try to get an ITP to try to keep the lobster fishery, um, uh, you know, in uh, as as we know it. And so um, I would urge the the commission to. Or the, or the majority of the commission to try to find a way to support this. Yeah, th thank you, Dan, and, and thank you, Bob. Um, you know, as much as I, I hate to see the detrimental impact to the, the commercial fishermen, I, I think we have no choice but to approve the recommendation before us. And, um, you know, personally, uh, I will vote to uh, approve it as is, uh, because as indicated, the whole foundation of this action is set on this. And if we don't have that, then it's, it's just gonna fall down and we could have a situation where it may not be good. So uh, I, I support Dan what is here on this slide. Thank you. Well, well, the next slide would have the recommendation. So Jerry, why don't you go to that? So Mr. Chair, we would be looking, uh, this is the director's recommended motion. We would be looking um, either for a motion to adopt this. And if no motion is uh, put forth and seconded, uh, then additional discussion as to how the director may amend it. May I make a motion, Jar? So, Khalil? All right, I'm, I, just to get things going, I'm, I move to recommend the motion that is presented before us on the slide. Thank you, Khalil. I need a second. Mike Pierdock, is that a second? Yes, or a hand off? I second it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, would you like to entertain additional discussion? Yes. Yeah, I, I believe Bill Amru wanted to move to amend. Is that what I heard earlier? You did hear that, but I was told that the amendment uh, would have to come from uh, the director. But I do have a question. Can, can Danny, can you tell me under this scenario, how many additional days of closure are going to be applied to the North Shore over and above what would already be in effect? Probably 90 days, right? Because there is no closure uh, outside of the pink areas, uh, as we described earlier. There's no closure um, okay. levied on 90. them. And, and this is, 90. remember, yeah, this is the state waters fishery as well. And many of the of the North Shore fishermen who have federal permits uh, would be uh, avail uh, eligible, or, or it would be legal for them to, uh, you know, move their gear into the EEZ. Um, and so this is just. This isn't a prohibition on, on lobstering from the port. This is just a prohibition on the gear and state waters as well. Thank you. Lou? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, like I said before, I mean, I'm, I'm very conflicted on this, you know, and um, I was just gonna throw an idea out there, Dan. Um, like I said, uh, uh, up until the public comments, I was, I was in favor of this if I thought the problem went away, but it just, I, I can't see that. But maybe to take a page out of the federal uh, plan uh, recommendations they just came out with, uh, where there is less gear in the water here. Uh, if, if guys wanted to fish with ropeless gear, I mean, you don't need the technology, to be quite honest with you. Uh, it's a pretty simple way to fish ropeless gear if you wanted to um, without having all the, 
electronics and everything off. All it would mean is some weights and <laughs> run your end line out, and grapple your end line up. Uh, possibly have this area. So if guys want to try ropeless, just as the federal plan has in that area up in the mid coast, Maine, um, uh, a, a possibility because I've just, I'm uh, very conflicted on this. Uh, like I said, because I just, I just hope it isn't something that's going to, again, I understand the situation we're in, but I just, I don't know. It just, but that was just a thought, you know, that maybe you could follow that federal plan and, uh, allow guys where is this less gear that time of year in the spring want to set some gear and um be able to maybe be able to work it out a little bit i don't know i'm just trying to come up with something here you know so okay thanks shelly hi there thank you um i just want to say like everyone i i i'm conflicted with this too and see you know the strain this would put on the industry but also i'm trying to balance without this um, you know, uh, take, take permit, we, we won't be able to have a fishery at all. So um, one, I just had one question, you know, in this recommended closure in the North Shore, is there any way if we approved this motion today, could we also say we'd like to um, further analyze the risk, risk percentage assessed in this area to um, you know, see if there's other measures that can be taken place in the future to lower the risk and possibly change the, the closing closure um, in the future. Certainly, um, you know, all of our rulemaking um, can be uh, an iterative process where we can make amendments going forward. Um, I would just like to say that going into the ITP application and the and the June trial, I'd, I'd like to have this particular uh, regulation, if approved, um, you know, codified. So we've got uh, at least a baseline to defend. Great. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you. Um, I, I'm urging the. Uh, the commission to, 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 to move forward on this motion to, to pass it. Uh, there's been, been a lot of hard work. I too listened to the public comments in December, both nights, two and a half hours each night. And I was moved by uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, interest that went into it. Uh, we heard from conservationists, we heard from the industry, we heard from the ropeless uh, gear industry. Uh, we even heard People talking about I'm a vegan and I'm against all, all taking of wildlife and marine. Uh, you know, there's there is precedent here. I, I realize we haven't had entire that many entanglements, but the fact is we have a precedent, and and, it's, and this is why we're making the decision today. And um, you know, we, we need to we need to really consider that we have a lawsuit in front of us, and Dan, and Dan said that if we open up that red area. Uh, if we amend it and we open that up red area, it, it, it could very well affect a lawsuit and it could very well uh, affect go, moving forward with the industry uh, on, a, on a federal level, I guess, and maybe on a state level. I, I, I feel that we, we need to make a hard decision uh, and, and to, and to uh, meet this lawsuit so that we can get through this lawsuit and then move forward. Uh, I, th I feel the director's memo was, was very and I read it three times and, and, uh, and word for word. And I, and I think it represented a thoughtful approach uh, in dealing with the current issue uh, of the lawsuit and, uh, and of the Endangered Species Act for both federal and state. I feel badly. My, my, I, I need to say, I said this in December, my heart went out to the members of the industry who are gonna be impacted by this. But I, I feel if we don't deal with this and we don't, we have two livelihoods, the right whale and the, and, the, and the livelihood of the fishermen. If we don't deal with this and, 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 we, and it comes, the lawsuit does not come back in our favor, and I don't know how to use the words as to whether we win or lose a lawsuit, I, I, I feel that in the long run, it's gonna, it could very well affect the livelihood of the fishermen even more if this lawsuit um, it, uh, does not come out in our favor. So I'm really urging, I'm, I'm gonna vote in favor of the, of the motion, I moved it forward. 
And I would urge, if you are conflicted, and I, I believe me, I'm conflicted, but I feel that it's more important to protect the right whale and also to protect the livelihood of the fishermen. I think we can do that by moving forward and, and having the closure. I know we don't like it. And I know it's gonna be an impact on, on some of the people in the industry, but in the long run, I think it's gonna benefit everybody. Thank you. Bill Doyle. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, just a point of information and something I wanna clear, uh, clear up. Uh, Commissioner Amaru made a statement that the amendment has to come from the director. The way I understand it and the way we've worked in the past is that the recommendations come from the director or DMF staff and it's presented to the commission. The commission then can take that motion and amend it. So if, if the commissioners want to add, change the motion or amend it that they can, is that correct, sir? Well, the way, the way I've always understood it is we get a recommendation from DMF. Uh, we usually put the motion up first. We have a discussion and either it passes or fails at which time the director will come back with a modified motion. He will amend the motion and bring it back to the commission. Right, but the, the motion actually, it's a recommendation from the director, but the motion actually comes from the commission and the commission can amend that motion during the meeting and vote on it. Uh, Jared, this is a process question. Can you answer that? I can. The commission can either move the motion forward or not move the motion forward. If the motion is not moved forward, then the director can modify a recommendation based on feedback from the commission. And the commission can choose to move that forward or not. If a motion is moved forward, it is voted up or voted down. If it's voted down, then again, the director can modify the recommendation um, and the commission can move forward with a second motion. Um, the process does not allow for the, the commission to amend the recommendation specifically. Um, only recommended motions can come from the director. They can advise the director as to how they want a motion recommended um, if they choose not to move it forward or if they choose to vote it down. Thank you. Shuggy. Yeah, thanks, Jared. I've been involved with this whale team stuff since the early 2000s, as long as anybody has. This, we've been down, going down this road towards ropeless fishing and what the NGOs want, we've always given in. I can't support this motion. The, U, the Massachusetts inshore lobster fisheries has never killed a right whale. And I can't see why we need to do this restriction now. So I'm voting no. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any further questions or comments. We have a motion that has been seconded. Would you like to proceed to a roll call vote? Yes, please. Roll call. Tim Brady. I vote for the motion. Tim Brady. Bill Amaru. I abstain on the motion. Bill Doyle. Bill Doyle, you're muted. Yes. Bill Doyle is yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. No. Lou Williams. Um, <laughs> trying to make a decision here. This, uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, yes on this, I guess. Mike Pierdenock. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. 
Yes. The motion passes six to one to one, Mr. Chair. Thank you, commission members. Uh, motion approved by roll call vote. Can we move on to the next recommendation, Dan? Certainly, Ray. Uh, the next issue is a um, is a extension of the of the current gillnet closure, which is the pink zone up on the screen at this point. Um, we're proposing to add. Uh, the red zone to this gillnet closure. It was somewhat of an oversight uh, when we were uh, regulating uh, the gillnet fishery in Cape Cod Bay years ago. The, that area in red was never part of the critical habitat, so it wasn't included. Um, it's somewhat of an oversight. We, we don't think it's, it's wise with, given the, the, the true density of right whales that we have in Cape Cod Bay at, at times. Uh, we don't think that this is appropriate to leave that area open. Um, but it's only that particular zone, uh, and we're not talking about extending that closure uh, any further. So, um, uh, but there's, there's very little fishing that's going on at that time uh, anyway. And as you can see in the memo, there's a whole bunch of other uh, ground fish closures that are overlaid on this, but it's just uh, in some ways kind of a technical correction where we had intended to keep the bay uh, proper close to gill netting uh, or the critical habitat anyway. And when the critical habitat was amended, uh, we never followed up. So, uh, if if you want to go right to the right to the motion, um, it's to uh, simply uh, expand that uh, January for, through May fifteenth sink on that closure to include that little zone in uh, Northwest Cape Cod Bay. Mr. Chair, point of process: Do you want to move a for a motion or have some discussion on this motion? or on this recommendation first? Well, in the past, we've always moved on a motion, then we open it to discussion, and then we vote on it. So uh, what's your best suggestion? Um, I think that really depends on how much discussion there may be on this item. I think with the first item having discussion first to inform uh, a motion was helpful, um, or recommendation, recommended motion was helpful. So I think we just proceed as we have uh, with the prior item and have discussion and then move for a motion. Okay, let's open it up to discussion. Please raise your hand and Jared will recognize you. I'm not seeing any hands raised, so we can move for a motion then. Thank you. Would somebody like to make the motion? I'll make it. I move. I move to move the recommendation, recommended motion, as demonstrated on the slide. We have Cleo making a motion to adopt the recommended motion. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it. Shelley Edmondson with a second. Um, would we like to proceed to a roll call vote, Mr. Chair? Yes, we would. Shelley Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Lou Williams. Uh, yes. Mike Piernock. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Excuse me, uh, my motion. Oh, Khalil, I forgot you. Sorry about that. That's fine. You have a lot on your plate. Yes for me. Okay, now the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, members. Can we move on to the next recommendation? Certainly, Ray. Um, as as mentioned in the in the memo, uh, we are proposing a uh, a statewide recreational trap gear closure. Um, we had uh, proposed a longer one than, than what we're proposing today. Um, you know, what we find is that uh, most of the abandoned gear that we see in the winter uh, is typically owned, uh, formerly owned by recreational fishermen. Um, and uh, as noted in the slide, uh, nearly 80% of the abandoned gear that is uh, that's picked up by, by uh, MEP at, uh, at this time of year is attributable to uh, recreational fishermen. If we have an earlier closure, it would give us a chance to actually get at that gear a little bit quicker. 
Uh, for example, uh, there are 15 right whales that were seen yesterday in Cape Cod Bay, uh, but the um, the closure doesn't kick in till tomorrow and or till the first rather. And I'll guarantee you that all that that recreational gear, uh, the owners don't even know it's there. Uh, so uh, we, you know, it's we've been kind of entertaining this for a long time. Um, it's it's not an unreasonable uh, you know expectation that a that a uh, non-commercial activity um, have a season. Um, you know, when we see uh, buoys in the water and the marinas are empty, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, and this is really to, to get at the lost and abandoned gear. We did get some negative feedback from uh, some fishermen who claim they like to go, you know, go fishing for their Christmas lobsters. Uh, you know, that, uh, I, I find that um, that's interesting. Um, and uh, I just don't think that for the for the good of the order and the, for the good of, uh, of working on marine debris issues uh, that it that that's worth it. Um, it wouldn't affect the, the scuba fishery, and it wouldn't uh, affect that little fishery in Cape Cod Canal where where there's no vertical lines and a, a few fishermen throw a trap into the canal with a, a weighted cable. Um, so uh, it would just be to the to the buoy gear that might be abandoned. So we are uh, proposing to uh, uh, go with a November 1st to May 15th haul-up period uh, for buoyed recreational lobster gear, which we think is, uh, is, is more reasonable. It gives fishermen all of October to get the gear out of the water. Um, and it would, be, uh, it would be after what we know to be any time, uh, or any right whales that remain in state waters, are, are, we don't have any records of, of Right whales beyond May 15th. So, and it's you know it's there isn't a whole lot to catch early in the season, as we know, um, and especially in the shallow cold waters. Uh, you know, it doesn't make much sense uh, for the, in most parts of the state to be fishing prior to May 15th. So we propose that this uh, this be enacted. All right, Commission members, we have a recommended motion. We'll open it up to discussion, as we have with the two previous motions. Is there any discussion? Please raise your hand. Sookie. Yeah, thanks, Jared. I like to uh, include Cape Cod Canal in the closure. I don't know why everybody else can, can not go lobster, so why they should be able to go. So Cape Cod Canal in the closure. Dan. Well, um, I, I, again, I, I would just repeat that the reason we're doing this is to uh, eliminate uh, marine debris and abandoned gear. Uh, we're not uh, we're not applying this rule to the recreational scuba dive fishery, uh, and I think that the canal uh, fishery, uh, you know, deserves an exemption as well because they don't. Uh, there's nothing about that wintertime activity or, or you know late fall or early spring activity that adds to to uh, marine debris as a result of them having gear in the water at that time. But I think, you know, not recreational lobstermen leaving traps out after Halloween, uh, most of that gear is lost. And like I said, it gives us a chance to, uh, law enforcement chance to grab some of the gear or notify the owners. Sometimes they don't even know uh, that it's still out there. So I, I would I would urge the commission to, to um, consider the, the recommendation as as drafted as as the most reasonable one yeah dan did i also hear you say that that lobster gear in the canal was buoyless gear mm -hmm. that's right the the cable is used to, usually the fishermen go down a low tide and they they tie the um the the, the coaxial cable or some phone cable or whatever they're using to, to a rock and they use a uh they use some kind of a flotation device to float the, the traps, you know, the 30 or 40 feet, you know, uh, off the shoreline. And, um, and it's, it's an interesting activity, uh, but, and, it, and it's, uh, it, it just, we don't believe it, uh, a seasonal closure on that is, is going to solve any, any marine debris or abandoned gear issue. Any more discussion, Jared? I'm not seeing any. Uh, would you like to move for a motion? Yes, I would. Please, somebody make the motion. Motion moved. So Thank Doyle you. moves the motion as recommended. Is there a second? 
Mike Piernock with a second. Uh, proceed to roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Piernock. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, commission members. If we can move on to the next recommendation. Thank you, Ray. The, the next one is interesting. Uh, it, it comes uh, from us, us DMF and it was uh, originally proposed uh, to uh, NIMS as, as part of our uh, recommendation going forward uh, as part of the uh, overall take reduction package um, for risk reduction. And what it tries to attempt to do is, is, uh, is get uh, fishermen who are capable of fishing, uh, you know, multiple trap configurations to do so in order to reduce the frequency of, of vertical lines in the water. Um, and so when I say capable, uh, you know, the most obvious one is small boat fishermen, uh, you know, really can't do that so well. So what we've chosen is a 29 foot cutoff and that vessel's 29 uh, uh, feet and larger uh, would be able to continue to, uh, to fish these single traps. Now, there is a map uh, in, the, in the memo on page 10, so where you can, I don't know, if Jared, if this is part of the, the next slide or not, maybe, maybe not. But um, if, if anybody has that, uh, that, that memo handy or can pull it up in the background, uh, there is uh, an area out to three miles, uh, as well as um, uh, Billingsgate Shoal area down the lower Cape Cod Bay. Yeah, there you go, Jared, thanks. Um, this, this area is where we've uh, requested an exemption in the past for single trap fishing. Um, and we were granted that in the large rail tape reduction plan amendments. Um, it, but today uh, we're talking about uh, sort of moving fishermen who fish on boats 29 feet and larger to, to move to something like doubles or triples uh, to try to remove some of these vertical lines from the water. Um, you know, there, there was some question about Gosnold. Now Gosnold is, is the town of, of, uh, of Cuddy Hunk and, and the, Elizabeth, the adjacent Elizabeth Islands. In that particular area, you're only allowed to fish uh, singles, uh, single lobster traps in those municipal waters. So that would have to be uh, uh, modified through, uh, the legislature is gonna have to change that and, and we've requested that that be done. Uh, I can concede that we've had a lot of uh, heartburn on this particular uh, proposal, especially from uh, one fleet that fishes out of Nosset Inlet. And this is an interesting uh, uh, story that the Nosset uh, Inlet is one of the three epicenters uh, of the outer Cape well, lobster fishery. Uh, the three would be Provincetown um, and then Nosset, and then the last would be a, say, a combination of Chatham and Harwich, where um, boats fish that, that, that unique area in the Outer Cape. And, and that area was subjected uh, to a effort control plan where we've given each vessel a finite number of traps on a, based on, for conservation purposes, um, based on their previous uh, fishing practices. And this was enacted 16 years ago in uh, around 2005. And so um, those, that particular fleet, uh, you know, really uh, came out in force and commented negatively about this proposal. Uh, there is a, a problem uh, with that particular area. Though the, the, that particular fleet has very low trap allocations to begin with, and they tend to fish boats in the low 30s in terms of and um, for, for safety reasons because of the bar. So, um, you know, I'm mindful of, of those impacts. And so at this point, I, I think um, I would welcome, you know, discussion among the commission um, about this uh, rule, because, you know, one of the things I did hear is that fishermen um, who had talked to us were uh, allegedly were gearing up to just uh, operate their businesses on a smaller boat. And um, I, I think that would be 
uh, problematic if, if we are enacting a rule like this that results in less safety and also uh, is so easily subverted. However expensive, it's easily subverted by going to a different size boat. So, you know, we're kind of chasing our tail a little bit there. So, but Ray, I would welcome the, the commission members uh, because I think they've been, uh, this is probably one of the proposals that's that's um, that's generated some of the most discussion uh, among the commission members and with the public to, to sort of talk this one out before we make a final recommendation. Thank you for that, Dan. Can we open it up to discussion, please? Bill Amaru. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, this is a, uh, a challenging one. Uh, commission members. I had a recommendation in my mind that I talked to a couple of people about and it seems to have uh, generated a little bit of interest. It would require Dan to modify his motion or his, his goals here and that would be for the vessels fishing east of the Cape, uh, particularly out of my home port in that Nosset Inlet, uh, to have the uh, minimum size vessel, which is important. I, I, I think getting away from the individual uh, trap ropes is going to be one of the things that we have to prove that the fishery service we're accomplishing. Um, the effort control plan certainly went a long ways towards getting us partway there. Um, and we don't want to be counterproductive by not continuing to contribute. But what I thought we could talk about doing perhaps commission members is to start with a, a larger size boat, a, a boat that's currently being used on an average size for our fleet. And that would be 33 feet. And to, to hold that be the minimum size uh, for a number of years and then have that sunset and go down uh, a foot or two for over a period of uh, whatever number of years that, that we decide to adopt until we finally reach the point where a truly small boat is the only boat that will be fishing singles or doubles. And I think that I think the idea of going to a double or triple even on a small boat is, is uh, doable. So those, 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 that's an idea I had. And um, I hope that we can modify this somehow to allow the fleet that fishes out of these shoal eastern facing inlets to continue to be functional. They're generally single dory boats. They're fishing alone. Um, it's a historical fishery. There's never been a situation where there's been an entanglement. And uh, again, I, I'd like to try to think that we're doing the right thing by the fishermen as well as by the whales. Thank, thank you, Bill. Uh, Dan, uh, any possibility of you changing your recommendation? Well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, Bob knows that uh, in this ITP, we're probably going to have to assess the, the turtle entanglements as well. And so we're, we're, not, we're certainly not done with um, buoy line reduction. There really isn't any, any breakaway uh, kind of a weak line option that we're going to get into that next, but there isn't a solution for, for leatherback turtles. And so as we, as we, um, as we strategize the ways to reduce turtle takes, it is something that we're going to have to uh, look at, um, you know, in the parts of the state where we do have uh, those and entanglements. Um, so we, well, not only do we have an issue in the outer Cape with low trap allocations, and I think that's what Bill was driving at is, is some of these guys they can't they can't scale up. Uh, we also have uh, the area two issue uh, where their trap allocations have been reduced by. Uh, 50 percent. They started out low and they've been reduced by 50 percent over the last six years. And so I think I'd like to hear from a few more commission members who might be familiar, uh, you know, with those uh, those those small boat fisheries, maybe even including yourself, Ray, because you have a familiarity with that fleet and uh, maybe Shelley to talk about the area two fleet, because that's where the opposition was coming from. Mr. Chair, I'm seeing Sookie. Suki, you recognize. I'm going to move to Shelley. Hi there. Um, thank you. So, um, this I have some concern with this recommendation for uh, you know the vineyard fleet where where we are. We have a number of boats that you know, fish lower trap, they have lower trap allocations, they're fishing single-handedly, and the, the single pot um, fishery is 
safer for them. So this measure would really impact a lot of people. Um, so I, I feel like since you know this recommendation is posed to be effective January 2022, um, is there a way we can table this and form a committee to, to discuss this further? Because I feel like if we were to move for, forward with this now, um, we'd be impacting a number of fishermen um, around the vineyard in uh, the Elizabeth Islands. Dan? Yeah, um, I guess I would turn to, to get some assistance from Bob in, in terms of our uh, in, incidental take permit application to try to gauge uh, his assessment of the criticality of the buoy line reductions that would come from this rule and, and see if, uh, if, if he had any thoughts on that. Sure, Dan, I'll speak to that. Um, so, I mean, this one of the primary reasons for going down this route was one to, to uh, try to address removing as many buoy lines from the water um, as we can, but also uh, as part of the incidental take per, per process, our first step is to distinguish ourselves from the other north from the northeast lobster fishery and have Massachusetts listed as its own fishery. So one of the additional benefits is going down this route would be to um, to be the only jurisdiction that that doesn't allow for singles fishing with the exemption for small vessels. Um, that said, you know, based on analysis from our stats program, um, this rule would reduce the number of vertical lines that we put in the water by roughly 7%. Um, so <clears throat> we could, well, I view this as an, an, an important piece of, of our package. Um, I, I think there's room to um, find alternative methods, but just keep in mind, we could still be looking to substantially reduce buoy lines some some other way if not this way um so you know uh that and as dan said um in future rulemaking we're, we're going to have to address uh turtle entanglements and so far the all the measures in this are are completely uh focused on conservation for right whales so things like the closure and the, the weak 1700 pound line doesn't do anything to move the conservation needle for turtles. And that's something that we're going to have to consider. And uh, a singles prohibition would help with the turtle aspect. Um, so I, I guess I would leave it at that. Jack. Khalil? Thank you. Um, let me lower my hand. I. Uh, I'm thinking about this, and, and, and one of the paragraphs in the memo allowed for to create in good cause exemptions. And I'm wondering, I mean, we're talking about, uh, I know that we have this, the, the three major areas on the outer cave. We have Provincetown, Norset, and then Chatham Harwich, uh, Chatham Harwich, you know, Chatham slash Harwich, and um, making it three. And uh, I understand there's a, there's a great concern with the Norset fleet. and. Um, and I know that I think we, I think we should allow. I'm not, I'm not sure how the, the 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 motion reads, but I think we should allow for some uh, good cause exemptions. Uh, number one, being uh, for for people who are disabled, who uh, can only fish the way they've been fishing, and without us putting a burden upon them. And I'm sure they they'd have to show good reason, good cause. But I'd like I'd like to be able to it, somehow. Uh, in, in the recommended recommended motion, be able to have a clause in there that says that the 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 director, the director uh, upon you know examination of the request, show a good cause exemption, uh, or be allowed for allow for a good cause of exemption, uh, and uh, and rather than just saying it's twenty five feet, I mean if I if I were someone and this twenty nine foot rule is going to affect me, and I've talked to uh, the director about this, I, I, I would just go out and buy a 28 foot boat and, um, and, and make that change to be able to, to fit the way I want to fish, fish. So I think we should allow the, 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 uh, the director to be able to make a decision on a, on a, on a, uh, individual basis rather than a, just a blanket 
29 foot rule, but to be able to have in there that the, the director is able to, uh, to, to make a, a decision for good cause exem exemptions. Thank you. Tim Brady. Jim, you're uh, um, I, I have, uh, I'll start with a question that I think I know the answer to. This, this is for both um, commercial and recreational, um, this, this motion, is that correct? This would be commercial. So it would be just commercial because what, what I was thinking about was um, uh, there's, there's a growing um, um, trend within like charter party, um, both six pack and inspected boats to add a particular, you know, we have people that call, they want to haul a lobster trap. And in that case, it's generally done in shallow water you know, you set a trap up in, in shallow water deep enough that it, it looks like it's deep enough to, but it's a, you know, it's a hand, you pull it up by hand. It's a small trap. You make sure that the trap is, um, you know, got, uh, you know, it, it's, it's got something that they're excited about. And I, I was just thinking about um, that that would be the kind of thing where you might have a boat larger than 29 feet, but they're probably, just doing it on a recreational basis so that a you know on a, a tourist can have you know the excitement of hauling up a single lobster trap from fairly shallow shallow water by hand so that that's part of your you know your trip so i guess that answers my question if this does if this is not um the is not for recreational Shelly? Thank you, Jared. Um, I just continue to be concerned with um, this recommendation. And, um, you know, many fishermen on the island fish single gears, especially single traps, especially in Vineyard Sound. And they, it's, it's safer for them. Many are either older or younger and fishing single traps is a safer way to you know, both start into the fishery and end, and also many are fishing single-handedly. So I worry about, you know, what this potential recommendation would do towards the safety of these operations. And um, I find it still concerning. Um, I know Bob said that this would reduce buoy lines by 7%. Is there a risk number that's associated with that too, Bob? Um, <clears throat> we don't have the, the you know, the, the, uh, any output rel at that fine a scale resolution for er every single, um, er every single regulation within the package. It, the model results that we have just looked at the, the package as a whole. Um, so the, 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 the thing with singles are is that they, they account for a disproportionate amount of buoy lines compared, um, uh, to a, a trawl fisherman and just so so for example if you had a an OCC fisherman with a with a 500 trap allocation fishing singles he has 500 buoy lines uh, whereas say you have a, a a fisherman with an 800 trap allocation fishing in 10 pot trawls only deploys uh, 160 buoy lines and so um that's where you see the big reduction in the in the seven percent reduction overall. Even though we don't have a huge number of fishermen fishing singles, it's only a small portion of the fleet. They they put out a disproportionate amount of the of the buoy lines. That said, it's at a time of year where we don't have a ton of whales around, um, so I, I wouldn't anticipate that the percent risk reduction would be just specific to that rule would be particularly high. Um, I think we get way more conservation for the measures like the closure that occur at a time year when there are a lot of whales around. Um, but it, it, it would afford us the additional distinction um, that we're looking for. So, yeah, but no, to answer your question, ultimately, I don't have specific numbers on the percentage that it, it uh, the, the ban on single specifically reduces risk. Thank you.
Mike Pierdnock. Uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, uh, you know, as indicated earlier, uh, th this uh, recommended motion is, is not critical as it, st as, as it stands in that you're uh, considering alternative methods. Uh, after you know, hearing uh, what uh, each individual has said around the table with the, those uh, lobster fishermen found within their area, their areas, and within their areas, excuse me, uh, would an appropriate approach be to withdraw this recommendation and then create a committee that could meet to uh, go over these issues and come up with a reasonable solution? Yeah, I would support that, Mike, um, especially because uh, going forward, uh, as Bob mentioned, when we deal with uh, the, the sea turtle issues, we also have some sort of area specific challenges uh, that I think knowledgeable commission members uh, would, it would be good to have you guys in, the, in those early conversations. Because uh, as, as I mentioned in the, in the propos memo, uh, that's right in your wheelhouse as a group that is uh, regulations on, on how, when, and where you fish. And so I think that would be, um, that would be appropriate to, to set up a subcommittee uh, because we're gonna need help uh, over the winter spring as we uh, work on some of these other issues. So Ray, can, at this time, can I, uh, I'd like to withdraw the motion um, and ask that, uh, that you consider forming a subcommittee of four members uh, that are, are knowledgeable about fixed gear uh, fisheries uh, to uh, meet with us and, and talk about these issues on a, on a larger scale. Yes, Dan, thank you very much. Uh, being how I didn't recuse myself, but you told me I could speak on this matter. I concur with what, uh, Commission member Bill Amaru, Shelley Edmondson, Mike Pierre Knock have stated. And uh, I think at this time, this recommendation should be withdrawn until a subcommittee is, is formed. I know we have to have something on the books by 2022, but in my mind, as with Bill, uh, Bill Amaru, I've had a number of lobstermen call me and we're talking about a 7% vertical line reduction. And already some of the small boat owners who are in vessels over 29 feet have already ordered vessels as Khalil had stated, 29 feet or less. So to me, as a retired commercial fisherman, there's a safety issue, number one. Fishing out of Norset Inlet is not like fishing the uh, Charles River. I mean, you're fishing the ocean and I don't want to put the livelihoods of fishermen at risk, you know, because they are fishing single dory. So yeah, I would love for you to re remove this recommendation and we establish a subcommittee and turn to and get right after it so we can have something on the books for the 2022 season. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. So why don't we move on to the, uh, to the next issue concerning uh, breaking strength. Uh, roll. Jared. Sorry, I had myself muted and I was talking. Uh, yeah, we can move on. Did we want to establish the membership of that subcommittee before we do? Uh, yes. Suki? Yeah, I'll be on it. Shelly? I'd like to be on it as well. How about Bill Amaru? Bill, would you volunteer for that? Yes, yes, I definitely will. And how about Ray? And Ray will round it out with Ray? Fine. I guess, I guess four. Yeah. yeah, okay. That's fine from a quorum perspective. Okay. All right. Next, next issue. Next issue. Um, is a, uh, I'd call this an early adoption of the 1700 pound breaking strength buoy line. This is a key component of the federal proposals that uh, for which the, uh, the uh, 
the rulemaking is open at this time. Um, we are proposing to adopt it uh, sooner than the federal government. And, and also um, we have a, a, a Massachusetts uh, version of, of the placement of these contrivances uh, should have a lobsterman uh, choose to fish his, his line that is heavier than a 1700 pound breaking strength. There are contrivances available that have been developed uh, by some um, of the social lobstermen that allow the, the, the rope to, to have, a, uh, you know, to have a, a sleeve built into it that essentially allows the, the line to break at 1700 pounds. And so um, this particular proposal uh, is based on a scientific study done by the New England Aquarium. They looked at all of the gear that was taken off of, of right whales uh, uh, they uh, they classified the injuries as as uh, as uh, either serious injury mortality or 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 not injury not a serious injury, and the determination was uh, if the if the entire uh, fleet throughout the range of of the of the right whale um, adopted a seventeen hundred pound breakaway uh, standard or, or breaking strength standard, then the uh, reduction in serious injuries and mortalities would be uh, around 72%, which is huge. And so, uh, you know, while there are many uh, who see the, the future, as Lou pointed out, uh, you know, ropeless, uh, ropeless, 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 uh, what, the, what the federal plan is proposing uh, in, the, in, in this next, what I'll call stanza of fisheries management is, uh, is weak rope. And so we are proposing to adopt the federal standards for weak rope, uh, but we want to do it early, and we want to do it um, if the, if there's going to be contrivances, we want to do it with a higher frequency than what the federal uh, rules uh, propose. Um, and so uh, you can see here, um, we would like to go. Uh, we'd like to start this in the spring. Uh, we've tried to give fishermen uh, working through the MLA as much advance notice as possible that this is coming. I know MLA is uh, been working and, and uh, to purchase some prototype um, 1700 pound uh, rope, which probably is a much more optimal uh, way to address this. Uh, but um, as far as the contrivances go, uh, you know, Bob has, has worked up a, a proposal uh, for, uh, you can see in that last line, um, uh, no less than every 60 feet in the top 75% of the buoy line. So that's, that's carefully crafted language, and um, and I'm going to let Bob uh, fill in any gaps that I have I have may have created in this. But this is something that that we've been working with for a few years now, uh, and in fact, uh, we've been given an ASMFC grant to help fishermen uh, deal with this particular uh, upcoming rule. Uh, we've hired a, a new employee to work with the industry to get into compliance. Um, so I'd like to hand it over to Bob to uh, fill in any gaps that I may have left. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, the one thing that I would add is that th this is a is probably the most critical or one of the most critical components to uh, getting our fishery listed as distinct in the NIMS list of fisheries. Um, based on early feedback from from them about uh, adopting the 1700 pound rule, they were they expressed concern that we were not providing enough um, options that essentially separated us out or made us distinct from the other fisheries. And they, they strongly suggested that we would, it, to, to achieve that, we, that we increase the frequency of the weak contrivances in the 1700 pound line. Um, and so based on that, um, you know, that there's been, Dan captured this very well in the memo, but, uh, there was you know, a lot of back and forth on this at the TRT meeting where uh, conservation groups were were really pushing for uh, an every 40 foot in the buoy line rule. Um, that's based on the thought that, it, that 40 feet is roughly the, the circumference of a, of a right whale. Um, but, you know, rightfully, many commercial fishermen pointed out that at some point, if you start to, you know, you make the... You, you make them have to put so many weak break, you know, weeks contrivances in the line, it just becomes completely unmanageable. Um, 
the 60 foot suggestion is, is, is a compromise that tries to achieve, you know, the, the goal of that, that more, more weak spots is better uh, while trying to also um, recognize not, not to put a, as much burden back on the fishing industry. A lot of fishermen, when they, when they add lengtheners to their buoy lines, they do so in 10 fathom shots. And so the 60 foot rule, uh, and, you know, has that in mind in that when they're adding a 10 fathom shot to their, their buoy line, uh, they could pre, you know, have a mark pre rigged. I mean, have a weak contrivance on that uh, when they, when they uh, add it in. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the, the primary idea behind this is to, you know, distinguish ourselves from all the other jurisdictions. So uh, our fishery can be distinguished as its own. So Dan, I, that's, I would give it back to you. Yeah. So, um, but Bob, you would agree that probably the best outcome is, is investment in some of this weak rope that's being developed, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think that the weak contrivance um, allows an intermediate step. But ultimately, I think as fishermen replace their rope moving forward, uh, they'll likely um, invest in 1700 pound rope, especially as, as, you know, new, right now we're working on two prototypes that, that are out and available and working and on using that. And I anticipate that as market demand increases, there'll be additional uh, versions of the 1700 pound line that'll become available and, and, and also address some of the you know, concerns fishermen might have with it. Um, but the, the sleeves in the short term allow fishermen who, who have newer rope, who hadn't planned on replacing all of their vertical lines, the opportunity just to integrate this, uh, a sleeve or contrivance in the, in the intermediate period until they replace their line. Okay, thanks. Um, Ray, back to you for any uh, discussion about this. Yeah, I just raised my hand. I'll lower my hand, Dan. So I know that a prototype was delivered to different lobstermen this past fall, I believe, by MLA, Beth Cassoni. And they have been more than happy with the results of the 1,700 pound breaking strength line. Uh, these are boats that trawl up. Uh, but I have some questions. Uh, question number one, and Bob's already mentioned it, that the demand isn't there yet. So if lobstermen want to go to the 1700 pound test strength line this season, because it's mandated for this coming May, where will they purchase it as opposed to using sleeves, which when you trawled up the sleeves uh, lock up in the haulers, they jam up and it's, it's not a good situation for people hauling trawl. So they, they want to go directly to the 1700 pound ten stri uh, tensile strength line, the red line, which I believe is specific to Massachusetts. Also, has DMF been, did you folks get a huge grant for this line from NIFWIF or one of those organizations? Yeah, I'm going to let Bob speak to those two questions. Uh, okay. Sure. So to answer your first question, um, Mr. Chair, uh, currently the rope is available. Uh, we per just purchased some through uh, Catch 'em Trap Supply. They're buying it from a cordage company in North Carolina called Rocky Mount Cordage Company. They've made the initial prototype weak rope and also a second weak rope uh, that consists um, uh, it, it try to address some of the initial issues of, of being true to diameter. So, and the second prototype is now available as well. Both of those lines have been tested on, on breaking strength machines and their tensile strength does break at 1700 pounds or below. So they are approved. They will be approved. Um, they, uh, as far as a grant, yes, uh, we did. We received a grant through ASMFC um, and we've already purchased uh, 450 coils of that red uh, weak rope that we will be distributing to industry members to, to try um, at no cost. And we also purchased 7,500 of the South Shore sleeves to distribute uh, to, to fishermen as well. Um, and we also um, have requested additional funding um, through the governor's office. And we're hopeful that we are go it's going to get approved to buy additional rope and sleeves as, as needed uh, to help with the demand. Um, and we'll work on distributing them. But 
you know, my understanding right now is that 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 rope is available through at least one manufacturer. So follow up question, Bob, the lobstermen will be able to uh, come down to uh, the New Bedford DMF office to pick up coils of the uh, 716 line or the sleeves at no cost. That that is correct. Uh, and it, or in fact, they won't necessarily have to come to New Bedford. But as Dan indicated, we just hired a new staff member. He started this week. Uh, we're getting him up to speed and it, we will be having him start to reach out to, uh, you know, fishing industry members at various ports. And and actually we'll, we'll we can, you know, attempt to or we will try to accommodate meeting, you know, a group of fishermen at a port to try to distribute this. Um, you know, upon request, and we'll we'll try to arrange that to to try to get it as too many people as possible within the confines of of what we have purchased and what we have budget to buy in the future. And Ray, it's three eighths, not seven sixteenths. Okay, and one more question or follow up. I, I was I was I was informed by one of the lobstermen who used the line at Beth Casoni got around to the different lobstermen to try. Uh, he was very much pleased with that, but his he told me that there's a second line and you have referred to two lines being manufactured. It's a wee bit more expensive, but it's already been signed off on by the uh, PRT team, the scientists and the green groups that they approve that line. Is there any, uh, can you tell me yes or no to that question? Yeah, so the, the, the second line, we'll refer to it as the candy cane line because it, it looks like the basically a candy cane it's red and white stripe pattern um it has been tested with uh, mla was instrumental in getting samples tested up at uh, at the breaking rope breaking machine in maine all the samples that have been tested broke below 1700 pounds that is going to be a, an approved line the new line addresses some of the initial concerns with the first prototype and the, uh, the all red line is that it wasn't true to diameter, even though it was supposed to be three eighths, it was more like five sixteenths in many cases, and it had a fairly high stretchability to it. That was some of the negative feedback received about that. Other feedback was uh, on the red rope was, was very good. So we had a mix. The new second prototype is supposed to address that, that stretchiness and also be more true to diameter. Um, and that is also available. I know uh, MLA has uh, purchased 200 coils of the red and 200, coils of the candy cane. Um, once we get our additional funding approved, we, you know, as we'll buy, we'll start buying some of the, the candy cane rope as well. And as I said, we, we have 450 coils of, of the red rope already in hand. Okay, so uh, coming back to my question though, this candy cane line has been signed off on by the uh, know-it-alls on the TRT, the scientists and the green groups, they've approved this line in their minds. Uh, we will achieve what we're trying to achieve in all these management actions on behalf of DMF. So currently there, NIMS hasn't established any particular approval process. So that I, I, there's not like a, you know, an official stamp of approval from National Marine Fishery Service on this. However, what I can tell you is that uh, the second prototype has been tested and it has been demonstrated to break at or below 1700 pounds. And as a result of that, we fully anticipate that that's, that's the benchmark and provided that it reached that benchmark, it is our understanding that, that that'll be acceptable. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I don't mean to slow this meeting down, but I just got a, uh, Bill Doyle wants to speak. So, Bill, you recognized? Oh, yeah, yes. Wait, just by the end, by the end of the meeting. Um, okay. I don't want to interrupt, but just if you could fit me in for five minutes, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So, we have comments from two commission members. Uh, Sookie Sawyer. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Uh, a couple of things about the new rope. It's in the it's probably in the pipeline, but uh, the guy, the company that's been buying the rope for Massachusetts and the MLA not willing to invest in it till this rule is actually passed. So I'm not sure what the timeline to get it up and running to have it manufactured. Me first seems like awful coming awful quick. And also I want the feds, whatever the fed menu is 
for breakaway strength when they come out with their rules. I want it to be automatically available to Massachusetts fishermen. If they come out with some kind of a knot or weak splice type of thing, I want Massachusetts lobstermen to be able to use that also, not just be limited to this red rope and south shore sleeves. That's how the um, rule is currently written, Suki, um, that it would be any NOAA approved contrivance. Okay, I just wanted to be wanted to on the record that it, that they come up with something that's not we're not talking about here today that it will be automatically approved. Okay. Well, yes. Okay. Thank you, Suki. Bill Amaru. Oh, thank you. Uh, could somebody could Bob tell me what what uh, rope diameter equates to the seven hundred pound uh, break strength that's currently being used in the in the industry? Um, so most common used line in the industry right now is three eighths. Most of the commonly used three eighths line breaks in excess of 3000 pounds. A lot of it up around 3,800 pounds. Um, okay. That's, that's good. That's what I needed to know. So we're not talking about dropping down to maybe five sixteenths and having that work. Cause it sounds like that would be too strong as well. Yeah. A lot of the, the, the standard five sixteenths rope made out of you know you know com the commonly available stuff it breaks at around 26 or 2700 and so that that's that's too much okay um yeah all right i i'm on board i think that the lobstermen can figure out a way to make this work so Ooh. williams Lou, you're probably muted. Oh, there you go. Um, just to <clears throat> climb on board with Suki there, you know, um, maybe uh, uh, the May 1st thing maybe can be pushed back a little bit if guys are going to be using this rope. I mean, myself, I think I'm just going to. I'm just going to use this rope for my end lines. I don't want to deal with those sleeves, and that seems like a a lot more uh, involved and uh, possibly, uh, I don't know if there's a way to make it. So, you know, uh, push it ahead a little bit just in case the rope isn't available. The rope's available and everyone can get all they want by May 1st. That's, you know, but you really, when you say May 1st, guys will need a little time prior to that to have it. They'll need it in April to get their end lines ready, you know? So I don't know if we can push that out a little bit to say July 1st, because we're talking about when the whales on here too, after May 1st so to speak, you know, so just a thought. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question, Jared, to Suki. Suki, if we approve this recommendation today, how quickly did the manufacturer tell you how quickly he would turn to to provide this line to the lobsterman? I didn't talk to the manufacturer. You only talked to uh, the rope company that was going to I mean, the, the, the uh, gear guy in Massachusetts is from buying it all. He just said he wasn't going to invest in all a pile of rope if the rule wasn't applied. He didn't, he didn't get into how long it was going to take for the company to manufacture it. You can find it out easy enough, right? All you do is make, we'll make a phone call. We can figure it out. Yeah, if you could, Suki, because I think that would answer Lou Williams' concerns. I just get in a text. It said three to four weeks. So that puts, us, that puts us into the end of February when it would be available in whole to the entire lobster fleet in Massachusetts. Hmm. Yeah, three or four, three or four weeks. It should be available once it's mandated by the state. Now we got more discussion on this recommended motion. I'm not seeing any more discussion, Mr. Chair. Do you want to move for a motion? Yes, I would like to move for a motion. Commission member, would like to move forward the recommended motion. So moved. With Bill Doyle. Second and Tim Brady. Tim Brady, okay, moving to a roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. 
Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Pierdenock. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Motion pass carries unanimously. Thank you all commission members. Jared, anything else here? We have one more recommendation on this. Yeah, um, this is a this is an easy one. Uh, this has to do with maximum buoy line diameters, which, as mentioned at the public hearing, isn't necessarily a, a conservation measure because it's the commonly deployed line. But what it is, it's a ceiling, and we're going to mandate that no line greater than three eighths be used. And what this does is it allows exoneration of at Massachusetts whenever we see. Uh, a whale uh, entangled in something larger. And believe me, most of the cases that we've seen over the last few years is thicker rope. And, uh, you know, in our collective minds at DMF, we look at those, those entanglements, especially with, you know, long, long strands of floating line. And, and when I say long, like hundreds and hundreds of feet, uh, four or 500 foot long, what appear to be buoy lines. We know that's not gear set in Massachusetts, but, um, we, we don't have a way to uh, sort of prove it. Well, in this case, uh, Bob's uh, proposal is to simply uh, make it unlawful to fish gear uh, thicker than three eighths on the commercial side and thicker than five sixteenths on the recreational side. And, uh, and that by default um, will exonerate the Commonwealth's fisheries uh, whenever entanglements are seen with rope uh, thicker than that. I think we can move, well, unless there's a substantial discussion, I think this is a pretty simple one if we want to go right to the motion. Motion to approve as presented. Is there a second to the motion? Second in. Motion moved by Bill Doyle, seconded by Shelley Edmondson. We're to move to a roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Piernock. Yes. Shelley Edmondson. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Ray, the next uh, part of the proposals is, is just housekeeping. It's a... Um, it's technical corrections and, and editing in the regulations that, um, that Jared has, has crafted in the draft regulations. It's eliminating old outdated maps. It's, um, it, it's consolidating the regulations into uh, one section. So the motion would be to approve all the recommended housekeeping amendments in those following sections as stated on the, uh, on the slide. I'm not seeing any discussion. We would like to move for a motion. I uh, move to adopt the, the motion. Cleo makes a motion to adopt as recommended. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second. I think there was a second by Bill Amaru. Um, move to a roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Pierdnock. Yes. Shelley Edmondson. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Ray, the last issue is the seasonal officer permit cap. Yeah, so this is not uh, an action item for the commission uh, on the permitting side. Uh, the, the commission um, doesn't. Uh, have authority on on permitting, but any smart director is going to make sure that uh, that the commission uh, and 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 he or she are on the same page on these fisheries management issues because so many fisheries management issues involve permitting. In essence, we're proposing to um, cap or add just minimal growth into this uh, student lobster permit. The student lobster permit is established by the statute. Um, and it is uh, it allows 25 traps 
during the summer months, June, I think it's June 15th to September 15th. And, um, you know, it's something that, you know, mainly uh, like relatives, young relatives of lobster men have kind of started out doing this. Uh, but in essence, what we want to do is, is just prevent a, a proliferation of these because the, the theme of all this is to try to reduce, um, you know, the footprint of the fishery or at least maintain it. And so what we're proposing is to, in the future cap, the number of student permits at about at 150. And I can tell you, I think last year's number was 94. And I don't think, uh, you know, that's pretty typical. I don't know if we've ever exceeded 100, but it's it allows just for a nominal increase. Uh, we don't think is significant. So um, uh, I just, uh, you know, we don't need to take a roll call vote on this. Uh, if there's any objections to this, uh, you know, speak up or I guess communicate that to, to me separately, but that is our intent is to go to final rule to cap it at 150. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any comments on this. Um, so this concludes the action item. We have four discussion items. We're at, oh. Jared, pardon yes. me, I have one question. Oh, okay. Uh, going back to the candy cane line, that is going to be pertinent to Massachusetts lobstermen, right? That will be a designated color for the state of Massachusetts. So uh, we will, it will be engraved that our gear, our top lines are candy cane colored as opposed to red. Because I believe we decided on a red for the Massachusetts color. Bob, can you answer? Uh, yeah, I can speak to that, Ray. Um, no, the candy cane line would be available to any commercial fisherman across the range, and and the 1,700 pound rule um, is going on is going to be in place through federal rule throughout the range. Uh, gear marking for Massachusetts will have to have a you know our specific a specific color, which NIMS has uh, basically told us is going to be red. Um, and if you're also a federal permit holder, you'll have to have green. Uh, the gear marking rule was not included, rule regulations were not included in this package because we were waiting for the NIMS rule to publish. We didn't know what our color was going to be or what was going to be required. Uh, so um, in the next round of, of rulemaking, we'll likely be coming back with specifics on uh, what that gear marking is, is, is going to likely to look like. Thank you for that answer, Bob, and I wish you luck uh, when you go to trial in June. If you present as well there as you have today, uh, I think we should win the lawsuit. I hope and well, pray. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the commissioners today for their work and on wrestling with some extremely difficult uh, uh, issues. And, you know, I just keep a promise to you that I'm, I'm doing my very best to try to uh, achieve this incidental take permit and trying to keep our fishermen as whole as is humanly possible. So I appreciate your efforts today. Thank you, Bob. I guess we can move along, Jared, to discuss. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we have an hour left of the allocated time today. We have four discussion items. Um, I'd like to try to get through at least three of them, the shellfish program update, the upcoming ASMFC and council meetings and the commercial striped bass management topic. Um, so if we could allocate about 15 to 20 minutes to each of them. That's fine. Let's start with the commercial striped bass management. All right, Story, I'm making you, uh, I will let you share your screen. Go ahead. Okay. Just let me get it pulled up here. Dan, do you want to start with this or do you want me to do yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, let me just accelerate this discussion a little bit. Um, we've been, uh, we, we have telegraphed our ideas on this. Um, we, we're trying to keep it pretty simple. Uh, we're trying to adopt some of the things that we, we've had at the end of the year. We don't think this is all that controversial or all that, um, all that challenging. And in fact, what we'd like to do is avoid uh, that in, those in-season adjustments by simply doing things that we think uh, are reasonable, uh, but just forecasting them at the beginning of the season. So specifically, we think we should start the season uh, with a four days, four days a week, uh, which still separates the, uh, the recreational and commercial sector fairly well. Uh, and then once we hit the fall, uh, depending on the um, available quota, uh, we would go to uh, five days a week 
uh, on September 15th. If we still have quota uh, by uh, October 1st, we'll go seven days a week because we all know the weather in the fall is, uh, is unpredictable, but typically bad. And then we also want to close this fishery uh, as of November 1st. Uh, we literally don't have any uh, striped bass left in state waters. Uh, there's so few by November 1st. And for administrative purposes, we feel we need to wrap the fishery up. And uh, a lot of the dealers would like to give us back their tags. They stopped buying, you know, after the summer or after Columbus Day. So there's no reason to leave this fishery open, commercial fishery open when we don't have fish in state waters. Because as you know, uh, taking striped bass from the EEZ is not lawful. So in essence, uh, that that's that, those are our proposals. We want to take them to hearing. We just want to get your, your blessing on that. Um, Story and, and, and Jared did an, a nice job uh, in the supporting memorandum, uh, description of the of the fishery, of the quota utilization, and of the discussion. So um, I, I know we're a little bit pressed for time, um, but it, this is a really uh, straightforward proposal from us. Comments? I have a comment. Yeah, Bill Emmer. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, the only one thing I see here that I think would be uh, will be discussed at the public hearings, and that's the um, November 1st being the close of the fishery of the year. The way the weather has been changing, we're getting later and later warm weather further and further into the falls. So I, I just don't think November 1st is going to be a, an, a good date to close the fishery. I, there are times when the larger fish end up on the backside and uh, in good numbers in the cooler weather. And you know, I would think November 15th would be a better date, but that's my own opinion on it. You know Otherwise, what, Bill, Bill, I'll take that recommendation and we'll, we'll amend it to the 15th. It's, this isn't, uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be that surgical. We, we want to accommodate all landings, but we know that at some point in the fall, there hasn't been any. So we'll, we'll make that amendment for you. All right, thank you. Yep. Suki. Okay. Yeah, it's just there's a lot of concern up here on the North Shore about opening the fisheries wide open on June 1st. And how much of the quota might be ate up before the actual, you know, guys up on the North Shore get access to them. That's all. So I was hoping they would either have a percentage of the quota or move it back a little mm -hmm. bit more. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dan, Dan, I thought uh, uh, we came up. Uh, we were going to start it a week earlier than June 23rd. I thought that was the recommendation. Well, uh, that probably is our preferred option. Uh, we can make we can make that uh, clear on the record as a as a preferred option and as a as a non preferred option. Go as early as June 1st. How's that sound, Jared? Sure. Okay. Suki, you good with that? So June 16th uh, is our preferred option. Yeah. That'll be fine. Maybe we compromise. Thank, Thank you. you. So I sorry, story, I stole your thunder, but um, in in light of the tight time frame, I, I, I think this is good. That's good and good comments. Yeah. Nice job on the on the presentation and the memo. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any further comments on this. Yeah, we can sure, if you want to take that down, I'll put the agenda back up. And we can move on to upcoming and recent commission and council meetings. Um, I, do we want to have Nicola go first? Yeah, on, the, on the critical yeah. issues that, that those decisions that might be coming out of this meeting. Okay. Uh, Sure. Did, did you want to do the subcommittee meeting summary on straight bass? Uh, no. No. Okay. All right. I mean, um, yeah. So I'll just draw the commission's attention to a couple of Massachusetts specific issues that are upcoming at the ASMC meeting next week. Um, we have two proposals in addressing the basses. So on recreational black sea bass, we did put in a proposal to adjust the, the season. Um, to start on a Saturday, I expect that'll be approved and we'll um, collect public comment following that approval. Um, perhaps a, a bigger issue um, and getting a lot of attention is uh, striped bass and the circle hook requirement that is in place this year. Um, we have submitted 
a revised implementation plan that would exempt pork rind from the definition of natural bait um, with that circle hook requirement. And we have also partnered up with Maine to um, uh, propose a, uh, a research project where we would study the, uh, the prevalence of uh, deep hooking associated with tube and worm uh, terminal tackle. Um, that specific terminal tackle uh, has received a lot of feedback that, that it can't be fished with a circle hook and that, um, that, that the deep hooking does not, does not occur with that gear type. And so we'd like to, to study that with Maine and during a two-year study project exempt that from the circle hook mandate so the gear could still be, um, still be fished. So we'll see what happens there. Um, and then lastly, another um, issue that's getting uh, a good amount of attention is the final decision is pending on commercial black sea bass reallocation. Um, you know, even it came up at uh, Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo's uh, confirmation hearing with the Senate. Uh, uh, and so uh, we're certainly um, working to um, hopefully approve an option that would be favorable to Massachusetts um, and, and that you know, follows the principle of, of responding to climactic based shifts in the species distribution and reallocating some of the quota um, in a way that um, responds to that, that shift in the species distribution. So I think those were the big items that I wanted to draw attention to. And there are some uh, materials in your briefing book that uh, reflects those proposals. Yeah, Nicola, if I could follow up, um, I and, and you and, and uh, Mike Armstrong, we met with uh, Mike Pierdenox group, the Stellweg and Bank Charter Board Association, and the issue of the uh, circle hooks on uh, tube and worm came up and, and also the questions about the uh, pork rind. And so I recommended to the, the Mike and to the group that that w since we in Maine were the only states that seemed to support uh, a, a kind of a more intelligent interpretation of, of natural bait and, and, uh, and where circle hooks would be required, that they should um, sort of, you know, uh, congregate or, or, or to reach out to their uh, organizations and, and other states, uh, those states that didn't support our exemption proposals. And they were very successful. Mike, uh, Mike and his group wrote a great letter. And, um, and I think it got a lot of folks' attention. And so I'm hopeful that, that we can get uh, sort of a sanity back into this particular rule. So uh, I really want to credit Mike and his group for, for uh, writing a good letter and, and getting the attention on this. Mike Kiernock. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, Nicola, and all, everyone at MassDMF uh, that uh, did all the work to uh, address the tube and worm. Uh, yes, it did take a lot of work to get consensus and agreement from uh, Maine all the way down to New Jersey uh, on the tube and worm circle hook measures. So th thank you very much. We hope for a, a positive outcome. Uh, the, the only thing I, I would like to just note is that uh, we're a little bit disappointed with uh, the fact that the black sea bass measures, um, and for cod, that we'll be talking about cod or haddock, don't include uh, specific measures for the four hire fleet. Uh, my understanding is that the, the feds uh, are going to go with status quo with seasons and bag limits, which that's what they have indicated are likely going to do, but it's not 100%. Um, and that one of the reasons why the bag limits for the four hire has been removed in, in these present uh, proposals is because uh, of COVID and that COVID's not going to have a detrimental impact to the four hire fleet. I, I wanna note that it still has uh, the, the phone calls that we would typically get in the month of January for bookings it, it's just not happening, unfortunately. And due to the ongoing uncertainty and difference between uh, restrictions from state to state, uh, it is continuing to uh, not result in booking. So with that logic, if the basis last year was for uh, 
separate bag limits because of COVID impacts. I just hope you could keep that in mind in the event it continues to uh, result in lack of bookings. So uh, I, I wish uh, we could continue. Well, I or we all wish we could continue with four higher bag limits and so on. But unfortunately, that's not the case. I, I don't know if you can uh, um, have any comment on that or, or Dan or Nicola. Thank you. Um, I, I would uh, respond that the with sea bass and, and cod, I believe as well, that those additional seasonal extension for the for hire fleet were based on the fact that the for hire fishery was fully closed for a certain amount of time in the spring due to COVID safety measures. Um, they did not respond to um, the obvious reduction in in bookings and clientele and interstate travel that occurred when the season was open, um, which will occur this year as well, I, I'm sure. Um, so it was only because the, the for hire fishery was fully closed that those, those seasonal extension occurred. So without a, a similar um, occurrence, I, it, it's a very slim chance that, that there would be a, a similar um, revision, at least uh, with black sea bass. Uh, and thank you. The only, the only thing to add to that is, is that, uh, you know, the May 15th date, I believe, is on a Saturday. That seemed to get the most uh, positive um, response by uh, the four hire fleet. But we, we continue to have the issue that those that fish Budridge Bay and those that fish Nantucket Sound, the, those in Nantucket Sound typically have a later season for the Black Sea bass to come into the waters and those in Budridge Bay are earlier. So that's kind of where we saw the split, where one would, would uh, like the other. Um, but uh, other than that, it, it, May 15th seemed to be the date with some mix here and there with the other recommendations. Thank you. I appreciate that early comment. And I'll just note that the, that topic will come back to the February commission meeting after we've gotten, uh, after we've done a written public comment period on the two options that are available for our CBAS season. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm seeing no other hands raised, no comment for commission members. Uh, uh, th thank you, Nicola. And I believe Melanie's probably at the council meeting as we speak. That's right. Yep. So there's, is somebody going to update us on the council? Well, I mean, I, I, I think Kelly Whitmore may be on, um, I, and I think in your mailing there was a summary of, of, of some of the council activities, and obviously if there are issues of concern going on at the council uh, that you members want to bring to our attention, that, and, and we could respond to those, but I don't know if we want to just do a rehash of, of sort of council business, but um, I know it was Mike Peternock who asked that we get, you know, more Melanie at our regular meetings or more regular updates, but unfortunately, um, we had to postpone this meeting until this week, which negated Melanie's ability to participate, but we'll make sure that she uh, is available at future meetings. Thank Mike Peternock. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, now you, you had good representation at the RAP meeting and um, ground fish and New England Fishy Management Council meetings. Uh, I did misspeak actually for cod and haddock. They did go with status quo with the measures for last year. We were looking for um, an increase of 20 haddock per fisherman or angler at 15 inches and, and that was shot down. Um, I don't need to get into the details of why, but uh, we, we unfortunately wanted that, the RAP recommended it, and it didn't get approved up above. So it, it would be status, well, it's on the books for status quo, but that still has to be approved. It was approved by New England Fishery Management Council, but it has to then go to the next step and approved by the National Marine Fishery Service. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Any others? Yeah, yeah I, I would just like maybe uh, to call on Nicola. Nicola, I, I think the theme of, of what we're seeing in a lot of these management bodies is because uh, data collection has been uh, uh, limited in the last year, that there's sort of just a, a general um, level of caution about liberalizing uh, 
you know, rules that um, in the absence of, of, of any good of sufficient data, would you, would you subscribe to that as sort of the prevailing sentiment among some of the management boards and bodies? Um, yes, it certainly uh, uh, was a large complication to the setting of the specifications for this year for fluke scup sea bass and bluefish, the lack of 2020 data estimates. In addition, the most recent estimates from 2019 for um, all of the species, um, the harvest levels, the new harvest levels through the um, recalibrated MRIP estimates are higher than the recreational harvest limits for 2021. So, you know, taking the pause on and doing status quo is, is better than the other alternative, which would have been reductions um, based on using the 2019 data with the absence of 2020 data. So all four of those species do have amendments ongoing that are looking at the commercial recreational allocation split. Um, which would in, incorporate the new MRIP estimates in the same way that they've been put into the stock assessments. So there may be some mitigating factor to those potential reductions. Um, but yeah, not having 2020 data was a, a big factor in, in status quo measures. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Yeah, that's a, that's a good summary. That is the the what is the behind the uncertainty, but lack of MRIP data and so on. One one thing that it was indicated though by the effort records is that the four higher fleet the EVTR data uh, indicated that the, the effort was like 40, 50 percent. And and when we see that, that's consistent with our observations of of lack of bookings or reductions in bookings. Um, so if, if you were looking at strictly from a four hire standpoint, the landings were way down, but uh, from a recreational standpoint, private recreational angler, um, they were way up. Uh, well, the point we were making with the uh, ACL for um, Haddock is, is that the average over the past few years, other than not having any data for 2020 uh, uh, for Haddock was that roughly, we were only reaching 24% of our ACL, recreational ACL. So we had been so below that target that uh, even if we did propose an increase uh, seasons and increased bag limits and so on, that there should be confidence that we're not even gonna come close to exceeding the ACL. But ultimately correct, it's the uncertainty, which is my understanding of why uh, it, it was not voted upon. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any further comments from commission members on this discussion item. Um, we're currently pretty well on schedule right now. If you want to proceed to the poor profile project. Yes, let's move along to the update on the poor profile project. And Story of the screen is yours. Thanks, Jared. And I'll just give a quick update on this. And I'm going to uh, visually kind of cut right to the punchline here, which is um, a view of the individual, um, one of the individual poor profile projects. So um, a reminder of where we're at with this, um, the project has been ongoing uh, for two years now. Um, the Urban Harbors Institute at UMass Boston was the lead on this report and it, they were funded with a 2019 seafood marketing grant award to put together this poor profile project. But what this really turned into was a collaborative effort um, between Urban Harbors Institute, DMF, and the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance to put this together. And the data sources um, are, are really twofold for this. Um, they heavy reliance on DMF's permitting and statistical data uh, with a ton of work done by our stats project to do statewide uh, analyses and individual port profile analysis. Uh, and then two surveys that Urban Harbors did surveying harbor masters and um, commercial fishermen about their uh, infrastructure needs in each of the ports and also what infrastructure they do have. And so it's all coming together now uh, into a final report that kind of looks at the statewide uh, trends in both uh, commercial fisheries landings and infrastructure and infrastructure needs and then some recommendations uh, and then breaks it down uh, individually at the municipal level. And that's what I'm gonna show on the screen here. Um, 
So the report itself, the larger report, will talk about some of the trends in fisheries landings and values that are notable and important relative to infrastructure needs across the state. Uh, and then for each individual port, um, we've kind of designed these profiles so they stand on their own. Uh, so if uh, you wanted to print off just your town's report, you could, and it would sort of stand on its own. So um, this cover page here will look the same on all of them. A little description of the report itself, what it was done, who did it, um, some of the key terms. And this is a draft. Uh, these right now are going out to the Harbor Masters for final review. And the final report, uh, including these individual profiles, will be published hopefully within about a month and we'll send it out to you. So here's an example, Chatham, um, a brief description of the, the harbors in Chatham, uh, the, the fisheries in Chatham, and then an overview uh, based on permitting information, number of harvesters uh, residing in Chatham with a home port in Chatham, number of trips landed in Chatham in 2018, et cetera. Then we get into, um, the landings in Chatham based on 2018 data, the total value, uh, some of the top species. So we wanna highlight all that. And then we get into some interesting uh, figures that show trends uh, in landings and value. Uh, this particular one is landings. Uh, the black line is number of active harvesters. And then we break the landings uh, in live pounds down by finfish invertebrates and shellfish. Uh, generally invertebrates are driven by lobster landings. So you can see the trends over the past five years or the 2014 to 2018 period. And then here's the value uh, broken down into those same three bins. Um, you can see how those trend over time. And this has been really valuable. Um, we, we often get requests for this data from shellfish constable, industry members, selectmen, uh, wh whoever it is, and to have these profiles on the shelf with some of this information will be really useful. Then the next page gets into the survey results, and this is the infrastructure uh, piece. And there's a, a description kind of summarizing what was found based on the surveys. And then we pull out some of the specific um, things that came up in the surveys like recent upgrades, infrastructure challenges, the needs that came out of the surveys, uh, and try to display it all here in a pretty digestible way. Um, so these will be going back out to the Harbor Masters and, and some industry representatives. Uh, just for ground truthing, make sure we got it right. Um, and then we'll put them all together and um, disseminate this both electronically and we we will print some of these and get them out as well. Um, we also have Gloucester here as an example. Um, you'll see it's a similar setup. And then we go into Gloucester. Um, got some nice imagery for most of the ports, uh, for all the ports. And um, you can see uh, what's important to Gloucester, lobster, sea herring, haddock, et cetera. Um, and I should mention that in the report itself, there'll be an appendix with many more tables where we want to rank, we will rank um, landings and value uh, by species. Uh, so say the top 10 or 15 ports um, in terms of importance of landing by species, because that's pretty valuable. So in other words, uh, top 10 landing ports for lobster, oyster, uh, ground fish, et cetera. We're working on those and we think that'll be interesting. Um, and you can see the, the, dis the differences, the distinction between ports when you look at it at this level. Uh, you can see the high fin fish landings in Gloucester and that's driven by the sea herring landings that um, you know, likely when we uh, redo this in a few years, you'll see that decline. Uh, but nonetheless, for these years, you see these fin fish landings driven by sea herring uh, and the value more driven um, by lobster in the gray. So um, you'll see all this and we, we hope to get some good feedback in the next couple of weeks and get the final report out as soon as possible.
Ray, does that meet uh, your request that you made to us last month for an update? Commissioner, members have comments on this presentation? Mike Pierdnock. Uh, thank you. It's really just a question. For the fin fish, is that just ground fish or does that include all the way up to bluefin tuna? That includes all the way up to bluefin tuna. And we define this in the larger report. So it's a good question. All right, thank you. Shelley. I just want to say this is a great project and it's neat to see what it's um, going to look like. I think it'll be really informative and um, thanks for doing all this great work. Mr. Chair, I'm not saying anything else on this subject. Man, can we move this meeting along, please? All right. Jeff, you're up to share your screen. Thanks, Jared. I'll uh, start with the uh, with mooring areas. So this would be 5D for everyone following the agenda uh, shellfish update. The uh, the changes uh, to the uh, NSSP were uh, finally published in October on mooring area uh, requirements, assessment requirements. It, uh, it's a new section in the model ordinance and it requires uh, mooring areas to be delineated that have more than 20 boats. Those mooring areas must be classified as conditionally approved or below a prohibited uh, uh, Classification does not require a pollution assessment, um, but a pollution assessment is required for all those mooring areas. Uh, as boats are a potential and direct source of pollution, they're, they're, they're floating uh, in the water, over the, over the flats, over the, uh, the growing areas. Um, they need to be evaluated. If, uh, if a mooring area is deemed a pollution source by DMF, uh, justification is needed uh, for the area to remain in the open status. Um, if a pollution source uh, uh, dilution analysis is required, uh, then uh, we have to determine if, uh, if there's any impact to adjacent waters. So not just the mooring area proper, but if, it, if there's any further impact uh, uh, beyond that, that mooring area. If the uh, dilution calculation indicates uh, adjacent waters are negatively impacted, those adjacent waters must be closed. <clears throat> and it would only be the, uh, the area that is needed to, to, uh, uh, to get that uh, uh, um, fecal coliform contamination under 14. So it wouldn't be the entire, necessarily the entire growing area. It would just be that those waters that were negatively impacted. Um, areas may be reopened once the boats are pulled for the winter and the assessment determines that uh, the area is not a pollution source. Uh, uh, DMF uh, work group has been established uh, where we have a mooring area appraisal form. It's been finalized. Uh, there's a, an, an online version and a hard copy as well. Uh, uh, the online will help us populate a database. Um, right now, uh, GIS mooring area layers are being uh, uh, populated and mooring areas drawn. Uh, Catherine Ford has been uh, leading that, uh, uh, that development of that uh, uh, mooring area layer, layers and uh, how it's being, um, uh, what the protocols are. So uh, uh, to map mooring areas, uh, we're, we'll use the town GIS data if it's available. Um, uh, without that, uh, we're using uh, uh, aerial imagery uh, if no town data is available. Um, so uh, it's kind of tough. We're in winter. We need to get this done. Uh, so uh, we're using uh, uh, Google Earth. We're using MassGIS, uh, uh, Bing Maps, uh, anything we can to try to locate those mooring areas. Um, and then uh, using uh, ArcGIS, uh, uh, able to uh, uh, create a, uh, an analysis, uh, use a tool uh, to draw a line around those, uh, those mooring areas. And uh, exactly what constitutes a mooring area is up to DMF to, uh, 
uh, uh, to determine, to define. And uh, so what we've started with is uh, um, uh, do gr drawing a line around all areas uh, that have uh, moorings within 100 meters. Uh, so that is uh, quite a long distance, but it, it does encompass, it makes for a smoother uh, uh, area is a polygon is generated. Um, our next step uh, that's coming from that is we need to create classification areas and that'll be with input from uh, municipalities. Um, so as you can see in the uh, top left, uh, there's a, a aerial imagery of Wellfleet Harbor. And during summer, and you can see the boats out uh, in, the, uh, in that area. Uh, the, the top right, uh, we've, uh, we've dropped a point on all those boats and moorings. And then uh, now our ArcGIS tool in the uh, bottom left has drawn a line around uh, the moorings that are all within uh, 100 meters of each other. And then working with the town, we would do something like uh, the bottom right. We'd uh, try to smooth out those lines a little bit, uh, make it a little easier to enforce and a little easier to describe. So uh, areas are assumed to be closed uh, uh, to shellfish harvest during boating season. We, uh, we're still assessing what criteria are, are needed uh, to allow an area to remain open. Um, prioritized areas are, are based on the uh, uh, a prior FDA evaluation and uh, FDA has, uh, has prioritized uh, BB3 in Westport, uh, CCB13, Wellfleet, uh, uh, CCB 42 Plymouth, CCB 45 Duxbury, and four Plum Island Sound, and seven Essex Bay, and nine Anasquam River, Hyannis Harbor, SC 27, Chatham, SC 42, and Edgartown, V19.1. The first reclassifications uh, of these prioritized areas will happen in the next week. Uh, we've been working with, uh, with the uh, constables in uh, these towns to try to uh, uh, develop what those, uh, if there's a problem and, and exactly what the mooring area would look like. Um, there are, you'll see in the list here, uh, those that are starred, we don't believe there's, uh, uh, we need to, to jump and do any reclassification in those areas. 13.3 uh, is a seasonal area already. Um, it's, uh, it's actually not that, uh, uh, it's actually not, this area, 13.3 uh, 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 is, the, uh, is the, the, the boat ramp area. And so that area is already a seasonal area. So that uh, uh, no further uh, reclassification needs to happen, but something will need to happen down below uh, where, the, where the moorings are, where the boats are, but that's not gonna happen in the next week. Um, uh, same uh, in uh, uh, Plymouth uh, Harbor, uh, uh, the moorings are in the prohibited area. Um, uh, and then uh, also Chatham, uh, uh, South Coast uh, uh, Chatham does not have, uh, uh, doesn't meet the definition of a mooring area. It's uh, actually uh, fewer than 20 boats. So uh, that will not, re will not need a, uh, a mooring area closure or reclassification. Uh, and V19 Edgartown, um, uh, that's, uh, Edgartown Harbor is already a seasonal area and it's closed in the summertime during the boats, uh, boating season. So really what we're focused on right now is BB3, uh, uh, CCB45 in Duxbury, and four and seven and nine and SC27. Uh, what are the concerns? Uh, uh, we wanna define our mooring areas as, as as you can see from those, uh, those images, uh, buoy to buoy uh, where necessary. Um, there are some areas that are an entire cove could be closed and uh, we'll do that uh, you know, in discussions with the towns if, uh, if it's not an important uh, shellfish area. So, um, but drawing, trying to narrow that definition and narrow that uh, reclassification, that area, um, will, it should limit the, the closures, um, uh, by avoiding um, productive waters and, and shellfish flats. Uh, so for example, on the North Shore, there are intertidal uh, softshell clam flats um, that are uh, approximate to the, uh, 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 to the mooring areas. So we think by 
by, by just defining those mooring areas uh, proper, uh, we, can, uh, we can limit the impact on uh, uh, shellfish areas. Uh, we've also done a uh, dilution calculation just as a default on all those mooring areas. So it's, it's uh, uh, Greg Bentoncourt was able to hard code it into our, our ArcGIS um, uh, uh, data layer. So we're able to take a look and, 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 and understand that uh, a mooring area is not, uh, does not need a closure or is not uh, um, necessarily a, uh, um, a problem to, uh, doesn't negatively impact adjacent waters. So we're, we're feeling pretty good about having the mooring areas out in the middle uh, uh, reclassified and dealing just with that and uh, that the impact does not go beyond the mooring area proper. Uh, same deal on Cape Cod, the subtitle leases uh, uh, are often adjacent to mooring areas. So we're hoping that by uh, drawing our lines around the moorings and uh, defining that mooring area proper, um, that we can limit the impacts to, to most of our, our issues. Um, uh, the other concern obviously is uh, um, would a change uh, in uh, classification going, a downgrade going from approved to conditionally approved, it may uh, preclude uh, trade with the EU. So what can be done? Um, we, to we limit impacts and closures, we need to reduce the occupancy and discharge rates. Those are requirements in the model ordinance. We have to assess the occupancy of a mooring area and the discharge, the assumed or actual discharge rates in the mooring area. So we could eliminate small or uh, vessels without a uh, marine sanitation device uh, from dilution calculations. Uh, we uh, could ensure adequate pump out uh, capacity in that area. Um, and the mun municipalities may be able to uh, uh, regulate those mooring areas, um, either um, uh, eliminate overnight occupancy or maybe uh, uh, require uh, a pre-approval by the town. Um, they could uh, institute fines for the discharge of sewage or gray water. Um, and then in some cases, maybe moving those moorings away from important uh, open shellfish growing areas uh, would be one way to, to mitigate any impacts on uh, either lease sites or, or open shellfish areas. Um, we, uh, for municipal and state enforcement, uh, uh, we need to, to, to have documentation that that is occurring, um, uh, whether it's patrol logs or some or an affidavit perhaps uh, by uh, EPOs or uh, by the local uh, uh, harbor masters or shellfish constables. Um, and then uh, we have to uh, review and verify it. Um, so that, that would be, uh, uh, these would be examples of how we could, we could address uh, if an area is well enforced. Um, we certainly could uh, think about segregating boats, maybe uh, those small boats that don't have MSDs, uh, they're too small for that, uh, versus the bigger boats that do have MSDs, and put all those, those larger boats that, that may be a threat together. And typically that happens anyways. Uh, deeper water is, is really for, for bigger boats, and uh, uh, the, the shallow waters, the, the flats, uh, are where the uh, sailing dinghies go or, or the small... Uh, uh, open boat center consoles go. Um, uh, municipalities may uh, want to move or may think about moving aquaculture activity out of the mooring areas or further away from mooring areas. Um, and uh, yeah, that, uh, or any other point sources, I, I should say. Um, so if there's a storm drain or, or we want to, you know, where possible, move it away from wastewater treatment plant uh, outfalls. That's always desirable. It just makes good public health sense. Um, and then, of course, if you could move those mooring areas, migrate them away or push them uh, away from uh, um, uh, critically important or prioritized uh, shellfish flats, that would be, uh, uh, that would be a good move. Uh, the, the new requirements are found in the NSSP uh, on page 63 of the 2019 guide. Uh, you can go to the ISSC.org website and click on NSSP guide uh, tab and you'll get a list of all the previous uh, NSSP uh, uh, 2019, 2017, and you can go back and see how the changes. Um, it's also on the FDA website. 
Any questions? Jeff, will you be talking about the wastewater treatment uh, buffer zones as well? Because I think uh, Bill Doyle wants to raise that issue. Certainly, I have a, a presentation on that uh, if we have enough time. Well, I think we should take the time because um, I know Bill wants to raise it. In some detail. Yeah, let's go to that now. And if we have questions at the end, we can field them. Ex excuse me, uh, Bill Doyle here. You're right, uh, Bill. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, could I speak now, please, before we run out of time? Because I know we have a drop dead on this meeting. Yes, by all means. Okay. And I'm sorry to cut you off, Jeff. Um, in 2018, the FDA and Marine Fisheries did a dye study in the embayment of Plymouth, Kingston, and Duxbury. They just, um, they just came back to us, and I'll be very brief, um, that they want to downgrade our growing areas, um, which, you know, we've, in that area, we've built tremendous brands, and this uh, would be really devastating to our industry. Um, and it's due to the potential risk of Plymouth wastewater treatment plants outfall pipe. DMF has managed this um, threat for years and we don't present a threat to public health. And I would appreciate the support of the commission. I wanna make a motion and the motion is as follows that Division of Marine Fisheries not make any change in the classification to shellfish growing areas in Plymouth, Kingston, and Duxbury. Further, that we facilitate a working group to ensure a program is developed that meets the needs of all, farmers, marine fisheries, and FDA. I propose that this group would be comprised of industry, DEP, DMF, FDA, uh, elected officials, and the town manager from each of the towns. The ultimate goal would be to secure a final lasting solution. And that's my motion. Thank you. A little here, I'll second it. Okay. We've got a motion on the table. It's in second. It's in second. Is, yes, Khalil, I heard you second it. Can we move this motion? Well, Ray, um, I guess I would have to check with, with the legal counsel about the commission's authority to, if it's just a request that we not change the classifications, we can, we can look at that. I don't know if the commission has the legal authority to um, constrain our actions or to affect our actions. I understand Bill's concerns, and, and I especially like the idea of, of creating some kind of a, of a working group to, to address this. Uh, I know the staff held a, uh, a couple of Zoom meetings, one with just the constables and then one with all the affected individuals, and it was uh, very well attended. And, um, and this, this issue has a lot of buzz uh, in, the, in the communities, the three communities, so I totally get that. Um, but but as far as um, the commission taking an action to constrain our reclassifications, I, I guess I would, I would ask that we, that the DMF have a chance to go back and, and, and look at that, um, you know, and, uh, and maybe uh, come back to this, to this commission with a recommendation of, of how to create that, that working group and whether or not we are in a position to postpone the, the reclassification and what the ramifications would be to our overall shellfish program. I think Jeff would, would be on the verge of saying that, you know, we don't want to risk a, uh, a, a non-compliance finding by FDA, but Bill's idea is a good one, which is to maybe try to bring FDA into the conversation um, as we deal with this three, uh, three town abatement. Jeff, do you want to weigh in? Uh, I think that's a good approach, Dan. Uh, uh, when it comes to a uh, public health, uh, uh, requirements, as, as we've all learned over the last year, um, uh, public health uh, operates a little bit differently. So um, I believe I believe that's a good uh, uh, call. I think we, we, we may not be able to forestall uh, uh, changes uh, uh, when they're, um, 
when the term uh, um, uh, adverse public health uh, is used and, and those that, that kind of terminology is being, uh, um, being lobbed at us. So um, yeah, I, I think let's having a, a, a work group is, is a great idea. And certainly involving FDA is, 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 is only beneficial. Uh, so I, I think that's, uh, I could support that. Uh, I think going to uh, a legal is also a wise idea. So I'll come back to the commission member who made the motion. Bill, are you amenable to this? Well, uh, I like what I'm hearing. Um, what I want is assurances that until our next meeting and until legal counsel is thought, that there will be no changes in the reclassification because that is Division of Marine Fisheries call, not FDA's. Dan? And yeah, I would ask Jeff, Jeff, can you give me your opinion whether we can hold off? Uh, the next meeting is um, th just three weeks away, February 18th. I, I, I think that's, you know, I think that's entirely possible. I don't, I don't think we'll have to jump before then, certainly. Okay. But, but that's our concern. We wanted to bring this up uh, and, and let people know and, and, and uh, that we're being pushed and uh, we're, we're, we're asking for extensions. We need additional information that uh, needs to be collected. And uh, it probably could take several months uh, or, or maybe the good part of a year to get the additional information we would like. Uh, so uh, if we could, uh, we may have to, we may have to meet FDA part way, and I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, having a conversation, having a work group uh, with FDA involved, we'll find out. So it's a good first step, but I think we can wait, uh, wait certainly the, the next three weeks, four weeks. Okay. I just want to add one thing that this um, decision or, or this direction um, came about as the result of the dye study that was done in 2018. After the dye study was done, all the channels that affect this, the hydrology of this area, one, I think it was 1.7 million cubic yards was dredged out of the area. And I can tell you from the way the water runs over my farm, it's, it's, it's very, very different. And I would propose that that the um, dye study now would be um, not accurate at this at this time. That it, that we may need to do another. But mm -hmm. thank you. So so Dan, uh, when would you like to form the subcommittee? I well, let me let me work with um, with Jeff because the subcommittee doesn't necessarily involve the commission. Uh, obviously, Bill has a strong interest in it, but. Bill is asking us to, to create like a working group that would include um, the local officials and maybe some federal representatives as well. So I, I don't think this is necessarily um, a, a commission uh, you know, activity, but um, it'll be an open meeting. So commission members could certainly uh, you know, check in on it. So I, I don't think this needs to be a, a commission subcommittee. I think it just needs to be a a committee of, of interested parties that, that we should push for. Jeff, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. That's okay, good. So, so what I'm hearing then is that you are going to turn to and stay in touch with Bill Doyle on this and move forward with a subcommittee? Well, to create a, a committee, um, Bill, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at your motion and, and work with you. Uh, we understand the buzz that we're getting from the three towns. Um, you know, we got letters as of yesterday. Uh, so we know this has to be addressed. So uh, we will work with you to, to create that working group. Great, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Dan. Can we move along? Yeah, Mr. Chair, we have um, the rest of this presentation and then I think we would um, move to end the meeting after this. Well, let's continue with the presentation. Okay. All right, thank you. This is uh, 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 largely what was uh, presented to the, uh, uh, to the uh, question and answer informational meeting um, back a week ago. It's uh, uh, in 
June 2018, there was a uh, FDA DMF uh, dye study conducted on the uh, Plymouth wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the executive summary uh, has was provided a year ago in January. Um, we have not received the actual raw data as of yet. We've, uh, uh, we've requested that. And uh, once we get that, we'll, we'll have about three weeks to, to analyze the data and uh, come up with our own recommendations. Uh, these are uh, NSSP model ordinance requirements. Um, they're not new requirements. These are uh, uh, requirements that have been on the books for, for many years. Uh, there's a, a mandatory closed safety zone um, around a wastewater treatment plant uh, and FDA uh, has a recommended thousand to one dilution line. Um, what it, uh, uh, the recommendations on the uh, uh, dye study were to expand that uh, um, and we've, uh, we have expanded it slightly but their recommendations uh, uh, ask that it be um, expanded out into the channel. Um, the, uh, there's uh, another requirement in the model ordinance that there be conditional area um, out to 100,000 to one dilution line. And that's, uh, uh, that would require reclassification of uh, Kingston Bay uh, uh, and Duxbury Bay. Um, that's, uh, it's uh, required around uh, uh, all uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant outfalls uh, if you're, uh, uh, if there's, if your prohibited area isn't uh, out to that 100,000 to one, um, it will result in additional documentation and, and uh, monitoring by DMF uh, in those conditional areas. We'll need uh, management plans, we'll need MOUs with the cities and towns. Typically a wastewater treatment plant uh, is discharged into a prohibited area. Uh, the thousand to one line is based on, uh, on dilution as well as uh, uh, time of travel and notification procedures. So you'd wanna set that, uh, that prohibited zone. So you have enough time to, uh, if there's a failure at the wastewater treatment plant to notify the parties to, to stop harvesting. The conditional area is uh, um, beyond that out to 100,000 to one. It's uh, calculated based on a total failure of the plant. So um, there's, there's no treatment going on. There's um, no disinfection. Uh, so, what would that, uh, how large you would have to set that area to get to that 14 uh, fecal coliform, which is the uh, approved area uh, criteria. Um, this is the uh, classification uh, based in June of 2018. Uh, you can see the green areas are all straight approved. Uh, uh, inside Plymouth Beach, mostly it's prohibited. And uh, there's uh, the uh, Jones River is prohibited as well. And there's a, a, a a conditional area uh, in Kingston Bay. This is the current classification. We've uh, closed that triangle area inside of Plymouth uh, Beach, uh, but uh, the recommendations do uh, request that uh, we uh, close into Plymouth Harbor, uh, the channel in Plymouth Harbor. So this is a, uh, a slide that uh, FDA provided us and it is a, a, com, a combined uh, slide of all the, uh, uh, the dye work, all the dye tracer uh, studies that were done over four days. And uh, uh, so uh, there were FDA used both uh, uh, individual uh, monitors. Um, uh, there were nine different ones out there they had and they set them and they, were, they would sample the water periodically for that fluorescent dye. And then in addition, there was a mobile uh, seabird unit that, that was a towed array. They would take it around the, uh, uh, the bay system looking to pick up the, uh, the dye signature. So uh, to draw your attention here, anything in purple is uh, um, uh, dilutions less than uh, 1,001. So you can see how the, uh, uh, the dilution is uh, less than 1,001 out into the channel. And then, uh, uh, the best uh, that you're hoping for is that uh, light uh, green uh, uh, tracer, and you can see a lot of that out in the uh, uh, out in the uh, channel, off of uh, uh, the beach, and uh, it's the the darker green shows that there's dilution that's uh, under a uh, hundred thousand to one, so it means that dye is found uh, pretty much throughout the entire three bay system. 
And uh, I think that's uh, the reason why the recommendation was to reclassify Kingston and Duxbury Bay as conditional because uh, effluent makes it there uh, after four days. So this was the recommendation by uh, FDA. Um, you can see the uh, conditional area that they're recommending goes out uh, outside the, uh, the mouth and uh, it includes all of uh, Kingston and Duxbury Bay. They have, uh, they divided it up into uh, area A and area B. Uh, area A, um, if there's any, uh, if there's a, a complete failure, raw sewage is going out of any volume. Uh, they recommend that there's a closure of uh, the entire uh, three-day system. And uh, the only, uh, uh, only reason that uh, um, area B could remain open um, is uh, there could be a failure if the flow is less than 200,000 gallons and uh, there was just either a settling issue or a loss of disinfection. Uh, but if there were uh, an upset at the plant where there was a settling issue and disinfection, uh, areas would close. So those are more conservative uh, um, requirements than what we uh, have been operating on uh, in the past. It's, uh, it, it, this is a, these are concerns and we're gonna have to review the data further uh, to see exactly how they arrived at these, uh, uh, these conditions. Um, they're providing the raw data to us. Um, we're gonna apply a, a GIS tool to get a more accurate volumetric calculations and see if that uh, uh, our calculations of 1,000 to 1 and 100,000 to 1 are different than what uh, FDA has recommended. Um, we'll need additional fecal coliform testing of the influent pre-disinfection and effluent in the plant, um, as well as uh, we may, uh, we've started to use some male specific coliphage, a viral indicator, uh, to try to determine what the plant performance is. Um, For the future, uh, apparently uh, uh, Plymouth is uh, undergoing a feasibility study and uh, uh, to see if they can uh, change their, uh, uh, eliminate the outfall or at least stop discharging through that ocean outfall and uh, discharge it entirely uh, uh, inland into settling basins. Um, we don't know if the pipe is gonna remain. I imagine it will uh, because uh, uh, engineers like to have a, an option uh, should there be a problem. Uh, and that's understandable, I guess, permitting as well. If you ever needed to, to reinstall the ocean outfall, trying to permit it would be very difficult. Um, another option might be for uh, if we could uh, uh, move transplant uh, product from our conditionally approved areas to an offshore area. Um, we don't know if that um, will we'll allow then um, a shipment export to Europe. Um, so that's a question that would need to be uh, um, uh, asked of FDA, but that, that might be a, an option. We have a similar area uh, set up down in Katema to deal with Vibrio. So this might be a, an option for, uh, uh, for us, but we don't know if this is, this is gonna be approved, if this is acceptable by FDA or by the EU. Um, the, uh, the requirements for uh, uh, shellfish growing areas around wastewater treatment plants um, it's in the guidance documents of the NSSP, and it starts on page 287. Mr. Chair, that's, that's my presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, informative presentation, but I think we've already heard from the director, and uh, you'll be forming a subcommittee, which Bill Doyle will be part of. And I would like to move this meeting along because I know commission members have some closing thoughts. But are there any questions for Jeff before we end this part of the meeting and move on? I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Very informative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we're going to move along to uh, commission member com uh, comments, and I'll I'll read your names off. I'm going to go around the table. We'll start with Khalil. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, commend you uh, for running a very efficient meeting today. I know we're slightly over, over time, but, uh, but I'd like just to say that previous to this meeting, I had uh, several questions and concerns regarding some of the action items we discussed and voted on today. And what I'd like to do is uh, thank Director McKernan for his genuine just generosity of his time in talking and communicating with me on several occasions to clarify my concerns. And I really appreciate that. He and the DNF staff put a lot of thought into the recommendations and I feel it showed today in our collegial discussions and deliberations. And, and I have to emphasize collegial. Uh, it's nice when we can have a, a group of people together who can talk and uh, agree to disagree and, and talk about the issues. So thank you very much and uh, I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you, Khalil. Suki, comment? Yes, I'd like to just have uh, see some, some leniency on the implementation of this uh, closure on the North Shore. Uh, February 1st is not doable. So I hope there's gonna be some extension of it. Thanks. Ray, if I could speak to that, um, these rules would only go into effect um, two weeks after a filing deadline. And at the current uh, schedule and calendar, the earliest, uh, everything would be in effect would be March 5th. Uh, that assumes we can get all the paperwork completed by February 19th. If we don't get it in by the 19th, then everything gets moved two weeks forward because there's a two week uh, interval with filing deadlines with the Secretary of State. So at this point, our, our forecasted effective date is March 5th. Uh, but if we slip up or if there's delays, it could be um, March 19th. Thank you, Dan. Bill Doyle. Uh, thank you, I've, I've had my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. I hope your concerns were addressed and uh, keep us tuned up on this. Lou Williams. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I had just one thing where I got some calls from a couple of the Gill Matters and one of the Dragomen this fall. Um, and I guess this might go to story. Um, they're just, they're just um, seeing an increase in yellowtails. And so maybe we take a look at the uh, what we're catching as opposed to the, the set aside to see if there's any room for, you know, increasing that a little bit from 250 up to, uh, you know, not like a huge increase, but maybe a little more if we're uh, not coming close to that, kind of like the way we, we look at the flu, flu quotas, you know. So uh, maybe keep that in mind for the next meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Tim Brady. All good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tim. Bill Amaru. Bill, Amaru. Is Bill on, Jared? Bill is on, he's muted. Um, would you want to come back, Dan? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, oh. I, was, I, had, I had my screen disappeared. I just got back on and I can unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I just want to say Khalil did an excellent job of expressing my feelings about how well this division is, of, of government is run and what a great job Dan and you have done today. And I wanted to also briefly mention that uh, I thank the department <clears throat> and the division for the work that uh, Kathleen Ford is helping us do in Orleans uh, with uh, classifications of uh, fish species for our dredge project. I know Kathleen left a little while ago, but uh, she's been more than helpful. And I want to thank her. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bill. Shelly Edmondson. Hi there, thank you. I'd like to um, echo uh, Khalil and, and Bill's thoughts on this meeting. Um, and I'd also like to bring up some concerns about the conch fishery, but I've had a number of fishermen reach out to me um, and I'm hoping we can maybe put it on the agenda for February. I know we're scheduled to go up in the gauge this spring and many are concerned about this. Um, I'd like to see how COVID has impacted this fishery. Maybe there's a way to get some um, 2020 landing data by then and compare it with 2019. Um, I know that they weren't 
applicable for the, the first round of the CARES Act. I don't know if they will be um, eligible for the second round. So anyway, taking uh, some time to look at this would be great. So Shelly, what I understand in your comment is you'd like to see Conk on the February agenda. Yes, please. Jared, can you make, can you do that? Can you make that possible? I can work to do that, right? Thank you. Mike, good knock. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, Khalil, well done with uh, the kudos to uh, DMF and the staff. Thank you. Um, uh, I agree with Sherry. Uh, if we could get Conk on the agenda for next month, uh, I've had those contact me about uh, their concerns. And uh, I believe that we have John McCluskey with his hand up from the public. Uh, he is the author of the Plymouth Duxbury Kingston Shellfish Growers Association uh, concerns that Bill Doyle uh, um, represented. And uh, I hope that that could be addressed and prevent a shutdown for them. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my closing remarks are I concur with what Khalil said about the MF staff but I have to let commission members know how grateful I am for their participation because without good commission members, uh, we don't get to where we want to go. The MF staff is a caretaker to both commercial and recreational fishermen in the state, but I'm very appreciative of this commission, of the members, how vocal they are. They bring a lot of good things to the table and you have a very receptive director who wants to work with his commission. So once again, thank you, Khalil. Thank you, commission members. I too, a uh, story, I would like to see conk landings. Uh, we went up in the gauge for 19 and 20. Uh, can you please make sure you've got the, that landing data for the February meeting, landings for, for 2019 and 2020? Because I believe uh, and I believe in Steve Wilcox's work, but at one time we thought that 1.3 million pounds was a sustainable level to harvest conch. So uh, I'm glad we're getting it on the agenda. Uh, I've gotten a lot of calls from conch fishermen. Shelly has, Mike Piernock has, and I understand uh, Bob Glenn and Dan are now attending a shellfish uh, summary council along with Shelly Edmondson, and maybe you can enlighten us about that also at the February commission meeting. So that's, those are my closing remarks, but I wanna thank both the EMF and the commission members who make this happen. So I guess we can go to public comment, Jared, if we got time. Yeah, we can squeeze some public comment in, um, if brief public comment, we have about maybe five to 10 minutes here. Okay, the way public comment works, uh, people in the audience, you've got two minutes and we will put you on a timer. So please be brief and to the point. Thank you. So Jared, you're gonna recognize people. I, I would start with that person that might peer not. I will, I'll, I'll recognize them in order of their hands being up. Um, I have five comments. So it will take 10 minutes to get through these comments. Uh, John, John McCluskey, you may unmute yourself. Thank you. I just did uh, appreciate your time. And, and uh, uh, just briefly, uh, we, we found out about the uh, reclassification uh, effort uh, on January 12 or a couple of days before the meeting. Uh, we were quite frankly stunned that uh, there'd been consideration about reclassifying the areas because this, has a, this will have a devastating impact on our marketability the value of our farms that we've been working at for years. And uh, to the point we're, we're, we're many of us uh, in, in the group, the growing group uh, are aware that the, the, the study took place, but we're really questioning um, how uh, legitimate the study is. You know, the particulate uh, from uh, the dye versus effluent is different. I'm hearing from some of the scientists involved in our group that this uh, was, was done improperly, the, perhaps the, the equipment wasn't properly calibrated. Um, but more importantly, we, it, we have in place and the, the division has in place uh, a 
closure procedure if there is a spill in Plymouth uh, that would do the exact same thing without casting a cloud over our our uh, markets and our, our efforts of over 20 years. I've been in the business for 22 years. Uh, many people have been in it longer and we've been working very hard for this and, and to, to hear about it two years after the fact is, is really quite uh, devastating to us, especially during a COVID period and, and where we've had a, 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 a year where it's been very difficult. Uh, so in any event, we, we would look forward to working with the division uh, we, we like Bill Doyle's recommendations. We truly want uh, you to, to back off and, and uh, um, you know, we, we think that because of the size of the industry that the FDA will pay attention to this. I believe uh, Congressman Keating's office is on, the, uh, on this meeting as we speak. Um, the other thing that's obviously very disturbing and we're just hearing about it now is the, the mooring issue and the reclassification on that without any input from, from the industry. Um, so we look forward to working with uh, members of Congress, the state uh, representatives, uh, the industry reps and, and the division on this. And, and we implore you to pay attention to uh, our needs uh, in, a, in a, and the most important thing is that, you know, the, the town of Plymouth, especially on the reclassification, they need to be doing something about this. I know they've opened their permit, but we got to move forward on this, and we this is like the sword of Damocles hanging over our heads, and uh, you know you 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 were affecting the the bank teller when the bank robber is uh, is, is run off with the money. Um, so uh, please, uh, we look forward to working with you, and and uh, we thank Bill for his efforts um, today, and 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 Dan appreciate your input as well. We have worked together in the past, and and we appreciate that. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, can I remind the public, uh, you've got two minutes each. Ed Barrett. Um. Yep, thank you, Chairman. Chairman Ray, uh, just a quick comment. After having reviewed the uh, 2,085 pages, I believe, of written comments, I just have the concerns that um, a well-paid public relations uh, comment uh, specifically in, in uh, to ropeless technology doesn't replace the careful deliberations that we just had today. So, um, you know, at, uh, I just want to, when we, when we start here in ropeless technology, like, like it's being proposed, I just, I just hope that we have people with expertise making the decision. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Uh, so I understand you just complimented the commission on what we worked through today. Um, Ray, I had taken away Ed's um, privileges okay. Okay. Um, Let's move to, to move on. Um, Drew Kolick. Drew, you have to unmute yourself. Drew, I'm going to come back to you. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay, back in October or November, you said that you were going to uh, allow transfer of fluke and CFAS rod and reel permit endorsements. Has any progress been made on this as far as setting up rules for transfer? Dan, you want me to take this? Take it, Jared. Okay, uh, yes, Drew. Um, we put forth a uh, recommended uh, transfer proposal, I believe back at either the October or December commission meeting. Story and I are in the process of finalizing that. Uh, it will be up on our website very shortly. Okay, thank you. Next. Beth Cassoni, you can unmute yourself. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time comment. I'd like to thank the commission. I know these have been some tough decisions to make. And I echo Suki's uh, concern about the new hard closure date possibly being implemented by March 5th. And even seeing that that's uh, about a month away, a little bit more, I still think the state should be cautious in that there's a lot of effort up on the North Shore that's gonna have to bring their gear in. So I hope that the state will give leniency where needed. And 
I'd also like to thank the division and their team, the CARES Act team. You did a great job. The money came in and it went out faster than any other state. And we were happy to send a letter of support for your award. So we just like to say congratulations on your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Attorney Operins. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Olaf Aprens. I represent approximately 40 to 50 commercial lobstermen, mostly fishing on the North Shore. I submitted written comments last night, and I appreciate the reference by the director in his opening statement. And I just ask that those be incorporated by reference for purpose of brevity. And in addition to that, um, I'd like to note, I appreciated Mr. Glenn's presentation about the Bayesian peer-reviewed co-occurrence models that form the basis for um, these closures. However, I find it exceptionally troubling that the one area where these Bayesian peer review core occurrence models were not run was the very area that this body just voted to close or extend the closures. There wasn't any, uh, this model can easily be run with respect to the North Shore and it wasn't. And we're more or less basing this on the ball, but appears to me to be the ballpark estimate of Mr. Glenn, which I likewise appreciated. Now that ballpark estimate is that, you know, saying that there's approximately a 12 to 15% uh, improvement uh, based on this uh, North Shore extended closure. However, I, I, I seriously doubt that. And I don't think it's best on the best available science because we can't compare the baseline to the existing model uh, because uh, the uh, we also we have to, because we also have to take into account the extended closure to May fifteenth in Cape Cod Bay. And so I I find it. I don't understand why that model could not have been run prior to closing this area. Uh, and, and I find, and I don't know the reason why it run. And uh, other than those reasons, uh, the 60% um, uh, reduction uh, that NOAA approved on December 31st, 2020, uh, should be the guideline for obtaining this ITP because that's, that's the same standard for NOAA to obtain its ITS, which is governed by the uh, pending lawsuit in Washington, D.C. And so I see a lot of uh, suggestion that we're shooting in the dark, but at this time we have, a, we have more or less a, a roadmap to use. And uh, I asked in my correspondence that we, uh, we reconsider this new information and uh, we run these models and, uh, and uh, the fact that we haven't uh, creates uh, some problems if this rule gets finally adopted. And uh, other than that, I, I rest on the papers I submitted last night. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Abdow. Hey, how are you? Doing well, oh, go right oh, ahead. Second, please. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Steve, Stephen, we can hear you. Go ahead. You're on, Steve. Hello? Start speaking. Start speaking, Steve. All right, we're going to come back. We're, we're going to have to go past Stephen. Greg Morris. Hi, uh, yes, uh, Greg Morris here, Duxbury Bay. Um, yeah, first off, I want to thank everybody uh, on the commission here and as well as DMF, um, especially during this pandemic and these trying times. It's it, to get things done efficiently and effectively. It's definitely a challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, just cut to the chase real quick. I understand time is a constraint. You know, Duxbury alone, it's a $12 million industry, um, our oyster industry um, and shellfish. And, um, you know, there is a lot at stake, you know, we just found out last week, some of the details, looking at the dye studies and stuff like that, you know, and it's gonna, you know, this proposal of going overboard with the condition areas, um, you know, it's going to limit some of our markets, lower our, our values of our product and our, our farms, unfortunately. Um, so we would love and appreciate us to be, use some science, better science and, I'll really look at this a lot better. I understand we're going to have a committee, a great, and I look forward to helping and participating in that. But just that, you know, we need to um, focus our gun sites on doing a better study, you know, something with a similar dye that has mimics the same as the drifting characteristics of the pollution or whatever their concern is, the FDA. Um, and also having Plymouth, you know, hopefully put that plant 
that pipe upstream uh, up in the land that would be ideal for everyone in the whole three bays but between then we may have to go with the fda having a conditional area which is great um we don't have one so let's put one as jeff's slide showed where the dyes were going uh during our talk he said you know where the yellows were and 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 the uh like green there was where it was uh problematic and so you know putting a line you know 300 yards outside that closed area um, along the channel where the majority of all flows out may be a more prudent way to go um, in essence if there's a spill the three bays are closed anyway so we don't need to put a, an additional bureaucratic layer on this whole thing and minimize and hurt people's livelihoods um, we can find workable solutions i mean the harbor masters have us on the dial we, we get response we get responses um you know when anything happens real quickly so we're not slowed down by that um so it's just an unnecessary burden on our industry um quite frankly and uh, I mean, we have support the East Coast Growers Association. They suggested the same, uh, somewhat the same thing, same as Massachusetts Aquaculture Association. So there's many of us voicing the same thing because what's happening here is going to happen all over the all over. Yes, you know, can I intercede here? Can I interject, please? Uh, this has been well discussed earlier, and they are forming a subcommittee. So I would suggest that you nominate yourself or talk to Bill Doyle about coming on the subcommittee. We do have to close this meeting. We're, we've, we're overextended at this point. So thank you for your comments. Please get in touch with Bill Doyle. Will do. No, thank you. That was punished anyway. Thank you. Thank you. All right, All right Mr. Chair. Uh, we are out of time, so we would need a motion to adjourn. Uh, if any members of the public had any comments that we weren't able to get to today, um, they can reach out to me or any members of the commission directly. and. Um, we can discuss that at a future meeting. Thank you, Jared. I need a motion to adjourn, gentlemen and ladies. Tim to adjourn. Brady, motion to adjourn. You have Tim Brady second. with a motion to clear with a second. Second. In favor. We're, we're adjourned. Aye. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.